Bill Stewart, I'm Chairman and, and Conservation Supervisor for Wayne County. I see some of our supervisors here. I see one from Cabell County. And Hi, Ken Brown. That's Ken Brown, he's our treasurer. He also is involved in the Century Farm thing. If your farm you think is 100 years old or more, you need to talk to him and get involved in it. That's a great thing and, and there's some rewards for the farms that, that do this. Any other supervisors you see? Um, Ronnie, of course. Of course, Ronnie's <laughs> the farm here. Ronnie's here. Uh, and I think that's it. My goodness, that's a poor turnout. We have two for each county. Should be around 12. But uh, two, two's all right. We got the other 10 to talk to. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Bill. Uh -huh. Get started here. My name is Corinne Powell. I'm the district conservationist in uh, Huntington, West Virginia, and I'm also covering uh, the capital district, which is Kanawha County. So, like Bill said, we do have quite a few speakers here. Uh, this is mainly geared towards high tunnel folks, but if you're a gardener, there'll be a great, a lot of great information as well for that. Um, if you haven't signed in, sign in. That's how we're doing the door prizes. If you have a high tunnel or you have a contract for the high tunnel, get a ticket because that's the, where the soil probes are going. And that's a, a nice sampler, um, and it'll be real handy for your farm. And Evan here, Evan Wilson, is the extension ag extension agent for Cabell and Wayne. And Evan really is covering everywhere right now. So um, get his information and, and give him a call. He's, if he doesn't know the answer, he's really good at finding it. Uh, extension Service has a great variety of experts that he can lean on. And so anyway, I'll turn it over to you, Evan. Welcome, Evan. Thank you, Corinne, and thank you, Bill, for having me here today. Back here, I guess it was a year ago I was out here, right? Yep, it was. Um, I think it was a little bit, about the same weather as last year, I think. Uh, not as rainy. Not as rainy? Well, <laughs> the high tunnel people don't care about the rain too much because you're in the tunnel, but outside we're glad glad for the rain. Unless you got hay down yesterday, then you made the mistake. <laughs> so as she said, I'm, the, I'm Evan Wilson. I'm with WVU Extension for Wayne and Cabell County, so I serve as the Guy and District Ag Agent, I guess, and um, Cabell and Putnam and Canal to County's questions too, I get. And uh, Mason. So, soil testing. That is our first basis. We need to look at when we're even looking at a plot of land if you're going to put the high tunnel there. You want good soil, but you don't want to start with trash and then you're, then you're setting yourself up for failure. So I recommend that you soil test before you decide, yeah, I'm going to build the high tunnel there. And then you can figure out what amendments you might need to make to your soil test itself. But first off, if you're if you have many of y'all done a soil test before, okay, that's better than some crowds I get in. Some it's one hand, some it's do what? For those that don't know, West Virginia WVU, WVU does do soil testing. It is free for West Virginia landowners, residents, because you pay your taxes, right? As long as you pay your taxes, it's free. If you don't pay your taxes, you're gonna be in jail and you're not gonna be able to test soil anyway. <laughs> um, so how long in between soil samples you should wait? For row crops and hay fields, that's every one or two years or when crops are rotated. Permanent pastures, every three to four. Vegetable gardens, every one to two. And lawns and turf, every three to five. Lewis Jett, our horticulture specialist, he recommends twice a year for your high tunnels. That way you can get in between crops and try to make those changes quicker in your, in your um, high tunnels. When to sample. So a lot of this is geared toward outdoor, but you can use it for inside to just make those changes that are needed for the inside environment. Soil samples should be taken in late summer and fall, because that's when your crops are going to be at their peak, pulling those nutrients out of the soil, and that is when you're going to need to make those changes for. If you go in late winter, early spring, sometimes that moisture in the, in the soil, those temperatures, it just does not activate the, the nutrients in the soil to to mimic what's going to be in the fall when those plants need those nutrients. And avoid taking those soil, that soil sample when it's wet or frozen because that's when you get mud. And the mud causes a lot of problems later on if you start messing up and doing the stuff wrong. We're going to go over what not to do with muddy bags. Do not take those soil samples immediately after lime or fertilizer because that will definitely screw your stuff up and you've already applied it and it's like, well, what can I do now to change it? You'll, you've applied two tons of lime per acre because that's the maximum requirement now or recommendation now because that's as much lime as your soil can absorb in a year. If your soil is on the acidic side, you're trying to bring it up where it needs to be. Or even longer if the weather is dry. So if you don't get any rain, you apply fertilizer and just sitting there, wait for it to rain a little bit. Where to sample? 
adequately access the nutrients that plant roots may encounter. So you're going to go three to four inches deep on most of our horticultural plants in the high tunnel. If you've got pastures hay fields, you're going to go, want to go deeper because those grasses and forbs that have been in that field, they should have a deeper root system and they're going to pull nutrients from deeper down. For your smaller areas such as gardens or lawns, you only need about five to eight samples throughout that area to get a recommendation, enough soil for a recommendation. If you're going into bigger areas such as your, your hay fields, pastures, 15 to 20 spots throughout that field. And as Bill showed you there a second ago, you could use these nice high tunnels that, uh, these high, high tunnels, the high tunnel producers are getting soil probes, right, Corinne? Yes. So, soil probe. You can purchase these. We have them in our office. I'm happy to come out and do them too, or um, contact your agent in your county as well. You can use these, you can use shovels, you can use spades. Anything to get in the ground and pull out soil. Um, these are handy because it's, it's nice. It doesn't take, it doesn't make a big hole in the ground. If you're using a shovel or spade, you're going to make a hole. Um, if you're using this, it's a little bit of soil, so crawl that hole and you're good to go. Um, I do not recommend leaving these outside. They Sometimes you can get ones that will rust, and then that, that just makes it clankier. They do make bigger ones with plungers in them, so if you don't like to use your pocket knife or a rod or something to push that dirt out of there, they make ones with plungers that are about three to $400, $500, depending on what brand you go with. Um, but for hot tunnels, these are great because your soil is going to be looser. And those and cost about 40 bucks. Those are about 40 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, affordable. Everything got expensive. <laughs> Everything has been expensive. It's gotten way, it's got worse, and we're trying to figure out more financial way, um, financially responsible ways to utilize our our time and our money. And if you're soil testing, that way you're not wasting your fertilizer in your high tunnels and wasting money because fertilizer is expensive. With the um, the Russian Ukraine conflicts, a bunch of our phosphorus fertilizers they come from that region of the world, and that's why those fertilizer prices are up. In West Virginia, if you are using different high tunnels or if you're, you should be rotating through your high tunnel, your crops, so you're not getting the same tomatoes in the same row every time. If you know you're going to the whole high tunnel on strawberries, just test for strawberries. Don't test for everything else. If you're going to do a hodgepodge and it's only using one stinner pump to, use, to send your fertilizer down through the drip irrigation, you may want to use, utilize the home vegetable garden one. Again, use a shovel or spade. And put that soil in a clean plastic bucket or bag as you're going through. Don't use an old dirty one. Don't use one that's been the old chlorine bucket from your swimming pool because it'll leach that chlorine in there and it can mess stuff up as well. You need to take small uniform cores throughout the area. Put that in the bucket. Sometimes if you, when it gets really dry or really wet, you can get cl claws of dirt, claws of soil in that, bat, in that bucket. You're going to want to break those up. Do not send that wet soil to the lab. They get mad and then they call me or they call the other agents and they're like, why did you send me a bag of mud? And well, I don't know why Johnny sent you a bag of mud. He didn't talk to me about it. So let take that, so if you took soil samples today when you get home because it's rained, put it on a paper plate, put it outside in a covered area, the shed, the carport, garage, somewhere your grandkids, kids, cats and dogs can't get into it too. Because that happens, they get on there, they dump over the plate, or they decide to use it as a litter box. Let it dry for a couple days, and then put one to two cups of soil in that Ziploc bag. Do not put a little bit, like it came out of a salt shaker. I had a lady there a couple weeks ago, she brought me some soil samples. Hey, do you think this is enough soil? If you're asking me if it's enough soil, it probably isn't. It was very little, like I don't, like, I don't know what they're going to test for you, because there's nothing there. So she had to go re-pull re soil samples. Some people think, I will speed this process up and I will heat this stuff in the stove, in the oven. Don't do that. Don't bake your soil. That messes up with the testing, testing process in Morgantown when they get it. Because that's part of their process. They'll take out the dry matter and figure out where your soil compo, um, composition is. And you're messing up the whole thing. Again, one cup, that's about a handful. One to two cups, depending on how big your area is. That way they get a better representation of your... Of your um, needs. Remember to include your name and sample ID on the Ziploc bag. So you've taken your soil, it's been on that paper plate, let it dry till Tuesday or Monday or whatever. Put that soil in the Ziploc bag. Write your name with a Sharpie permanent marker on the outside with your sample ID. So if it's high tunnel one, 
High Tunnel 1 with your last name. So it might be like Wilson High Tunnel 1. And then you're going to take your soil submission form and rubber band it to the outside of the bag. Do not put it in the inside of the bag. What happens when you put paper with, with wet, damp, dry soil? It gets dirty. And they don't like that in the lab. They like to be a little bit cleaner than that, ironically enough. Um, they get them, they got a bag of mud, and then they have a wet soil sample in there, and it looks like toilet paper. Like, what can we do with this? Because their process is, they'll take that soil, they get in the bag, they'll lay your soil submission on the workbench in the lab, and then they'll open up that soil bag, sit there for a couple hours as they're processing through everybody. If they can't read that, they have a really difficult time. And then we see when it comes back to our email, we'll have Johnny somebody call looking for a soil sample. Like, I don't see your last name on here. Because sometimes handwriting is not great. Mine, mine's got worse over the years. Um, so it, it makes it really difficult for the lab to understand who to send these soil samples to. Emails get mixed up. Phone numbers don't get right. And then we had a really difficult time getting a hold of people. How deep to go? Again, for permanent pasture, two inches. Hay fields, four to six. Row crops, tillage depth. Um, no till, one to six. Vegetables to tillage. And those lawns and turf are top two inches for established. And for those new, new turfs, one to four. Filling out the form. So we're going to go through all how to do the soil testing form itself. Because some people get confused on it. It's really simple once you see it. And if you're, it has changed over the last 10 years. I think we're in the fourth different soil test form because we've updated our lab testing equipment in Morgantown. For when we get to crop code and soil, um, and soil productivity in the soil series, if you're using the crop code, and this will make sense in a minute, that starts with an H, W, or V. Well, so, so home vegetable garden is H01 for a crop code. You do not need to put your soil series because there has not been a scientific method yet to determine if the, how effective the soil series is on different crop productivities. If you have um, the other crop codes, that's where it becomes, becomes essential. So the top half, of the, this is the um, second third of that form. The top, top third is just your, your, your contact information, your name, your county, if you're a West Virginia resident, your address, email address, and phone number. Put your entire phone number on there. Make sure it's legible. If it's not, I get soil tests back with just straight zeros across it. And I don't know anybody that has a straight zero, zero phone number. Um, their counties will be mixed up. Their emails will be all, all jacked up. You just can't read it, and it's really hard for them. There is an online fillable form. So if you have access to a computer, you go into our WVU Extension soil testing website, and you can get that form and fill it, make it fillable. There is another soiltesting.wvu.edu website that is the old form, and it's not fillable yet. So the top, the first one is your sample ID. So again, if it's Wilson, if it's your high tunnel, like Wilson One, Wilson High Tunnel, if you got 27 raised beds out there and you're testing each raised bed, give it a number. Because um, I had a lady do that for a church, I had a bunch of raised beds, and she had a lot of soil samples. County where the sample was taken. So you might be here in Lincoln County, but you, your farm may be in Greenbrier County. Put, put that there. I put in the top half. It tells your address, your zip code. It will go to both myself and Josh Paplowski, the Greenbrier agent. So we can both see what's going on and be able to help you. Previous management. So if it's a new high tunnel, put what was there before. If you've been raising Swiss chard for 15 years in the high tunnel, put Swiss chard. High tunnel sample. Yes, if you have a high tunnel, check yes. This way we can get a better idea of our soil needs and requirements in high tunnels because that's been the new addition to the soil testing form the last couple of years. If you don't get that alert, we can make better recommendations as we develop this um, background of the knowledge of the high tunnel soils. Organic matter and electrical conductivity and micronutrient elemental package. Those are additional tests you can pay for to get a better idea of what's going on in your soil, and we'll go over those in a second. So, size of area. So, for most of your high tunnels, there's probably going to be in the square footage, unless you got under, an acre under plastic in the high tunnel. That's a, that's a pretty big high tunnel. At that point, you're rocking and rolling, probably. And then, again, predominant soil series, that really doesn't matter for high tunnels, because it's become manufactured soil. So put high tunnel in there, that way they know it's a high tunnel soil again. And crop code, 
they sampled soil texture and tillage code. And if you have any weird things going on in your high tunnel the past growing season, write those here in the comment section. That way they can get an idea of what's going on. Or if you have a plant you're growing that's not in that crop code list we're going to get to in a second, write that here. That's how we get new crops added to the crop code list. Oh, what did I do? I know what I'm doing. Okay, so this is what that middle third of your soil test form should look like. Garden one, county we're taking, previous crop code. If it is a predominant soil series, like for my pastures or hay fields, it was a sensum ball. And sample area, area lines within the last 12 months. If you've done yes, no, either way, let them know. And then cost share program. And if you're doing the cost share program with Guy and Conservation District Green RCS, put that in there as well. And that way they can see where these where this um, these soil samples are coming from. This is the back of the soil tech soil test form itself. Again, the H, V, and the what was the other one? W, yes, W, which I don't see a W on there right now. Um, if you have that crop code, the soil text the right down below your hand. Right where you were. That's V's. And the oh, they're wildlife. That's right. The wildlife crop codes. Thank you. The, the, the soil series really doesn't matter for those yet. Um, but if you're raising kohlrabi in your high tunnel, it's V17. Put that on there. If you're raising a handful of different varieties, put those on there, and that way we can see what's going on. If you get soil tests back and you are wanting to grow green beans or tomatoes in your high tunnel and your soil pH comes back as a 4.1 or a 5.0, and you're like, maybe I should raise blueberries instead. Well, I can go back in there and change that crop code to get a better recommendation for your blueberries or whatever else you're wanting to change. And so you're resending soil, sam soil samples to Morgantown. I can do that from, our, from my office and just change your crop code and uh, make those changes pretty quick. Do you put the, the crops that are in there now or the crops that you're getting? The crops you're going in there now. Okay. The crops you have in there now would be your previous, previous management. Okay. So... If you have a bunch of strawberries growing in there or cabbage or lettuce or something, put that in there now and maybe put that in your comments. That's what I have now. And then put what I'm testing for this fall rotation. Okay. Thank you. And here, if you're, get, if you're getting your bigger field, it has your soil texture code and tillage code. So, mail them to Morgantown. Um, if you bring them to my offices, I take them sometimes if I'm heading to Morgantown for a meeting or something. But I'm not going to Morgantown every week, and the, the conservation district will mail in for free. There you go. Get them to one of your district supervisors in Guyane, or bring them down the office. We'll mail them in for you. There you go. We'll help you fill out the form. No fail system here. That's right. Just take them. <laughs> so again, place that soil in the bag. Write your sample ID on the bag. Rubber band your form to the outside of the bag, and mail to that address. If you're not, ta if you can't make it to the office, or get with your district supervisors. This address is in the top right corner of your soil test form as well. That way it's pretty easy. It looks really confusing, but the way that WVU's uh, mailing system works, it goes through all these addresses and ends up on the workbench. Additional tests. As I mentioned earlier, the initial WVU soil testing test is free. That's for your um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and um, soil pH, and we'll get to that in a minute. Again, electrical conductivity, that measures salt levels. If you all were here last year, that's what um, Jody Carpenter, the Barbara Randolph agent, went in great detail about measuring your salt levels in your high tunnels and how to change those and what problems you can get. Organic matter. If you are interested in improving your crop productivity or if you're going for, for organic certification, some of those labels require you to prove you're increasing your organic matter in your soil system. Micronutrients. Elements included in this package are aluminum, copper, iron, manganese, sodium, nickel, and zinc. And I've got a link to Iowa State for their micronutrient requirement forms. Again, I'll send this to Corinne, and Corinne can send everybody that registered, and that way you get I had an issue getting into the printer this morning. Um, I don't know if y'all can see this. This is a soil test form that we received there a couple weeks ago. Her pH was a 7.9. That is way high. Like normally my soil pHs around here are lower. 
Um, and then Corinne, you've had a bunch come in high, haven't you? Very high in high tunnels. And excessive on all the nutrients. And yeah, excessive in all these nutrients here. So this is kind of normal what I'm seeing. Sometimes I get them, they're all blue. Blue means in excess. They're off the, they're off the charts. If they are showing in red, that means they are very, very low. And it's time to add some stuff to bring those back up to where they need to be. You're wanting to be in that green Goldilocks zone. Um, yellow is caution. Red stop. Red's like, hey, help me, help me, help me. Um, and then your organic matter will show up here. Your EC will show up here. This lady was just doing a um, garden outside. It wasn't, it wasn't real. ornamental plants and maybe some shrubs. And then for your high tunnel, since you'll be in the square feet, they'll be down here at ounces per hundred square feet. Call myself or call another, call um, your extension agents, and we can sit down and help identify what fertilizer and what your rate should be for your system. And then if you flip it on the back side, they do give you some recommendation notes for your um, for your tests and different nutrients you should do and practice you should implement in your system. Um, and then down here is the new mic micronutrients, and that comes in parts per million. So it's not really ounces per hundred square feet, first per square feet or pounds per acre. That's parts per million, and we can work sit down and work through that and figure out what your um, nutrient needs are. So lowering pH again. Her soil pH was a seven point nine which is almost eight. So you're wanting to get down in the sixes for most of our plants. And this is from, uh, from Purdue. This is how much of elemental sulfur you need to lower your pH down to your desired pH. So she's a 7.9, so pretty much 8.0. And she's wanted to get down to 6.5 to start. That's three pounds of um, elemental sulfur per 100 square feet. If how many of y'all have hydrangeas? A couple people. Not very many. Wow. I guess because you can't eat them real well, can you? That's why. The deer eat them? So the hydrangeas, they have blue or pink blooms, right? You use a soil acidifier to change those colors on those blooms. That's what you're trying to do here as well. Additional publications, and I'll send this to Corinne. These are the links. These are really good resources to use. Um, up here is the lowering pH for horticultural crops from, from Purdue University. And over here is from Iowa State. This is the micronutrient. So if you want to get more information on how to interpret those micronutrient elements and what you may need or may not need, look through this guide here. It's, this is a free, these are both free downloads you can get from either university, and they're really helpful um, resources just to have on hand and understand the background knowledge on them. Again, here are the helpful links. The top one will take you to our soil testing for, um, marketplace so you can pay for those charges. You can either pay online or you can mail it with a check to the soil test lab and that way they can um, process your order. Um, again, the micro elements from Iowa State, soil pH, lowering. Are there any questions? All this information is on the uh, West Virginia extension? Yeah. Yep. Yep. A lot of this came directly from our um, soil, testing web, soil testing page on WVU Extension's website. Can you make adjustments to your pH after you've been <laughs> Yes. How quick? That's going to depend on. You may not want to shock your plants too. How? How? how where was your pH at? Do you remember? Depends what I was planting. Most of it's pretty high. Okay. You maybe had just a wait in between plants because you you can possibly burn them doing that too. Any other questions? Here is my contact information. That's important. Yes. So, um, at top is my email, the left is my Cabell County office, and the right is my Wayne County office. I do not have a Cabell County secretary, so sometimes our office in Cabell is shut down because everybody's out doing programs. Call Wayne. Connie is my secretary there, and she will make sure that somebody called me so I can call return phone calls. Um, the Cabell County office is now located in the rear of the, Milton, the current Milton Preschool which is the former Milton High School, in the old choir room. So you go around the parent pickup line there on um, West Main Street, and we got a sign out by our door. We've got a sign to put along the road, but working with the city and the state to make sure that sign is in a safe place and doesn't get hit by a semi, we're working on that. Um, the Wayne one is pretty easy to find. It's East Lynn Road, so you go to the top of the hill of Wayne, and you go out toward East Lynn, it's right there on the left. 
Um, if you're coming from Eastland, it's got the big 4-H clover on the end of it. So if y'all have any questions, give me a call. Or I'm, I'll be here for a couple minutes hanging out after work, um, for, for the next presentation that, I, that I've got for um, previous commitment. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Corinne. And make sure y'all soil test, because if not, you're going to waste your fertilizer and waste your money and waste your time. And it's free for the most part. Thanks, Evan. Yes. I just want to follow up with uh, some of the things Evan talked about. Um, you know, the, make sure you put your email address on there because we're not mailing them as much anymore. Uh, the other thing is, if you have a high tunnel, uh, you really need to watch that fertilizer. I tested 28 tunnels last fall. Every one of them had excessive phosphorus, and that's going to start causing problems with your production, you know, after that. Um, the Conservation District in Guyane has a great program that if you have a high tunnel, now this is this year, so I don't know if they'll renew it again. We did it once before. If you have a high tunnel that's five years or more older, um, they have a program that will help replace the plastic on your high tunnel. You remove that plastic for uh, two months and plant a cover crop, and they'll pay you 25 cents a square foot to replace that plastic, even up to two, um, two layers. So I don't know if there's anybody in here. I don't see anybody in here that may fit into that, but if you have any questions about it, make sure you come up and ask. Um, and some of those phosphorus levels, we actually cut the phosphorus levels on some of the soil tests we're getting back are um, exceeding environmental concern, which is not good. Yeah. So we've got a process to help bleach that out and get rid of it. So the long story short is a lot of time when you buy fertilizer, there's three numbers on that bag. The middle number is the phosphorus number. So please get a hold of your extension agent. You can call my office, me. Anybody that works for me knows how to read a soil test and can give you a recommendation. A 10-10-10 is generally not going to be the fertilizer you need. It's going to be calcium nitrate or potash or some of those other ones. And they do make specialty fertilizers for high tunnels, and we can get you in connection of where to buy those. Anything else you got? Yeah. We joke, our state fertilizer. We joke that our state fertilizer is triple 19. Because that's what everybody uses because it's got 19% 19, 19 of everything. 19% of everything is not, not always great. You've got different feed rations for your cats and dogs, right? You've got different feed for your puppies and your big dogs. that They have different nutrient requirements. And, but you go from baby food to solid food, right? So you got to change your nutrients up and make sure that you've got the right stuff. Or you're going to get stunted growth and you're going to be calling me, why my tomatoes got blossom end rot? All right. Well, let's give away a couple of these soil probes. Evan, why don't you pick us a ticket? Who's paying me enough to draw their name out? <laughs> What's the last three numbers? Last right? three. Two, one, two. Two, one, two. Two, one, two. Nancy, Nancy. great. Yay. Nancy. All right. Nancy, why don't you pull one? Okay. Pull a ticket from Evan. No, Nancy, if you don't have a soil test, because I, I get Lincoln County soil test, too. <laughs> I'll know she didn't use it. Evan, don't make soil tests for us. I'm going to start needing reading glasses, I hate to say. 216. 216. Who was behind her in line? <laughs> 216. All right. Come on up here, Tracy. You want to give away one more? Bill, you want to give away one more? Give away. Okay. All right. Tracy, go ahead and pick one more. Oh, wait. I don't want to figure. Yeah, you don't want to. He brought his wings. 209. 209. 209. No? Maybe from last year. Maybe. <laughs> Pick another one. 213. All right. BA. Okay. BA, why don't you give me a number between 1 and, uh, let me see here, 40. Pick a number between 1 and 41. 33. Brandy Brabham, come on up and pick a, a door prize here. You can pick anywhere between a rain gauge, a soil thermometer, or a trash picker upper. You know, a lot of uh, our creeks, and especially there in some of our watersheds, have a lot of trash, so the district's trying to promote people to, you know, keep, keep the creeks and their, their neighborhoods clean, so... Um, Anyway, this is a kind of pick what you like. Brandy, give us one more number. Uh, 17. 17. 
Well, that was a uh, BA, so give me another one. Uh, nine. nine. That's going to be Harry Edwards. Harry, oh, pop on up and get one. Right. You help us out so much. All right, our next speaker um, is from WVU Extension as well. He is uh, our expert in pests and insects, and uh, I've got to know Carlos over the last year, and uh, he's has a lot of great information, is uh, great at communicating uh, um, those how to treat pests and those types of things. So if you're hanging around and you can catch Carlos, please make sure you ask him some questions because he has a lot of great experience and knowledge on handling the pests that you encounter in a high tunnel. So Carlos, I'll hand it over to you. You didn't say he was a pest. He said He's he not a pest. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me over there? So uh, my name is Carlos. Uh, for those who's wondering about my accent, I'm from Honduras. If you don't know where that is, it's U.S., Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and Honduras. Very tiny country. But I did my master and PhD at Purdue University in Indiana and, uh, on entomology. And today I will talk about integrated pest management for vegetable pests uh, in, for, yeah, for vegetable pests. So IPM or integrated pest management is the combination of several approaches to control a pest. Okay, those approaches can be cultural, mechanical, biological, or chemicals. And they should base on pest identification, pest biology, monitoring, uh, control strategies, and evaluation. So let me spend a little bit of time on pest identification and pest biology, and why this is important. So I like to use uh, as an example, this Japanese beetle, because everybody or most of the people know what a Japanese beetle is. So, in fact, if you haven't seen it, I have some over here. So, I will pass this around. There are two insects right there. One is a Japanese beetle, and the other one is a June beetle. And the reason I use this one is because, as you can see, the life cycle of Japanese beetle most of the time, most of the year, they are in the ground. We do not recommend you to try to control this insect in the ground because it's too expensive. And even if you control it in your area, once they're adults, those that are outside your area, they will come and fly to your area anyway. So it is not economical. But anyway, sometime in June, they fly in the beginning of June through the end of July or beginning of August. This tells you that if you had Japanese beetle in the past, you should go and check for Japanese beetle in the first and second week of June. And if you see a lot of them, then you should decide whether or not you want to control them. Right? I have received emails from people late July, early August saying, hey, I have a lot of damage of Japanese beetle right here. What do I do? I tell them nothing. Why? Because in the beginning of August, they will die anyway. And whatever they did to that point, whatever pesticide that you apply, you will, not, you will not fix your plant. So it's too late. And that's why it is very important to know the life cycle of insect. Similar example over here. This is a squash vine ball. So if you plant squash or pumpkin, these guys fly from the middle of June to the end of July. So how they complete the life cycle is in the middle of June, the adults will start flying. Then they will lay their eggs. They will mate for, they will mate and be active for about three to four weeks. Once they lay their eggs, they lay their eggs on the soil close to the plants or they lay their eggs on the plant. So if they lay that eggs on the main stem, that eggs will hatch and will go inside the plant. Once it's inside the plant, they feed on the plant and they stop the movement of water from the, from the roots to the up of the plant, right? So that means that if you apply a systemic insecticide, there is no water movement, so it won't do anything. 
I'm also, if you apply a contact insecticide, it is inside the plant, so you won't be able to contact it. So that being said, once it's in there, it's basically impossible to kill it. And these guys will kill your plant, okay? So uh, one way to do it is just put uh, some pocket with uh, water and soap, and it has to be yellow because they're attracted to the yellow color. And other things that you can do is apply pesticide, but you have to apply it at the time that they're flying. So you have to know the biology of that insect, and that's why I'm insisting, or I will talk a lot today and tell you why knowing the biology of that insect is, is important. Here is another example right here. So we have, I will pass this over here again. Please notice that I will call it shoulder so you can understand me, but it's not, that's not a call of shoulder or the back, but this part over here, this insect right here on your left is a, is a beneficial insect because they feed on other insect pests. This over here is an important pest. This is a brown memory steam bag. They look very similar and you will see it over there. The way that you can distinguish them is by looking to the shoulders. Here you can see that it's kind of like point, pointed where this one over here is kind of like rounded, and you will see it over there. But you may have a bunch of these in your high tunnel, and you may think, oh, shoot, I have a lot of memory steam bag, and I will spray some pesticide, but you actually have some biology control agent, so you're killing the good guys. That's why it's important to identify your pests. Or the opposite, you may think, I have a lot of biology control, agents, but you actually have a pest. So, you know, so you, you get that point. Well, I have other examples right here. Um, I will pass uh, these uh, insects right here. Uh, this one contain a Mexican bean beetle and a ladybug. So the Mexican bean beetle is a pest on beans and the ladybugs, uh, ladybugs, we all know that they're beneficial. But I put the ladybugs that looks, that have the same color, so you can see how important it is to identify that insects. And the way that you identify that is by seeing the head of the ladybugs. The head of that ladybug have some like W or M, depending on the angle that you're seeing that, that insect. Another example right here, why to know the biology of that insect is important. In this case, this is trips. So trips are important pests inside protected areas such as high tunnel and greenhouses. So they're not a big problem outside, but in the high tunnel they are. Here we can learn the life cycle. Here is the adult, the adult will lay eggs, then these to larva over here or nymph, they will be on that foliage of your plant. Whereas these other two stages, they will be on the ground. Okay? And then later, when they're ready to be adults, they will go and be active outside. Why this is important? Well, some people have told me I apply a pesticide. I control most of the trips, but then they come back. Well, the problem is you kill all the trips that are on the foliage, but those that were on the soil, they're still alive, and they will, came, they will complete the life cycle, and they will reinfest your plants. So that's why it's important if you are controlling trips to make sure to control the stages that are above or on the ground. So then we have white flies. How many of you have seen white flies? Okay, so mostly, in case you haven't seen white flies, I have white flies here. We'll pass, I took those, they're still alive, so don't open this. Because <laughs> the owner may be upset about it. <laughs> so um, it's important to know white flies because most of the people think about that uh, adult stage and they target the pesticide to this adult stage, but 
they have to know that they have other stages, and those stages are really hard to see. They're very small, and they're sometimes not translucent. So they're very, very hard to see. And they are always under the, on, under the leaves. So it's important to have very good covers when you're applying insecticide to these, to these guys. But anyway, once you identify your pests, and you know the biology of your pest, you should also be aware of which are the key pests that you have, the occasionally pests and the secondary pests. So especially the key pests. Key pests will be those that are a problem every year. And how do we do that? So I recommend How many of you have seen this? Okay, very few of you. So I recommend this book to know what are your key pests. So this book, if you want it, is free in internet. If you have a computer, you just have to type Mill Atlantic Commercial Vegetable Guy, and basically the first link you see over there, just click it, and you will be taken to this web page from, uh, from the university in, uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. And then you can get the free PDF from there. If not, you can buy it for like 20 bucks. Okay? So you can buy it from them or you can buy it from uh, Louis Jet, who is also a special it, uh, who also worked by West, West Virginia University. But anyway, this book, uh, this is the last version, is 2020-2023, but you don't have to buy it every year. You can buy it every four or five years because it changed a little bit, but what we change is, for example, if there is a new product that is good for wildlife, then we add it or if a product is discontinued, we take it out, or if a product is being removed. So the changes are, Excuse me. The changes are minimal. And when I say we, is because West Virginia is in there, and I, I help to keep this uh, updated. <laughs> but anyway, within this book, I choose tomatoes, because most of the people uh, plant tomatoes. It tells you what are the varieties of tomatoes that you can plant. It tells you what is the recommendation nutrients based on soil test, fertilization schedule, and also cover all different pests. So when I say pests, it covers weeds, covers diseases. I am entomologist, so I will focus on the insect part. So with this, it's telling you that these are the key pests here in the Middle Atlantic region. So, is saying that it's aphids, mite, trips, Colorado potato beetle, wildfly, flea beetles, leaf minor, steam box, and a bunch of caterpillars. And I agree with this. So unless you don't, I, I, if somebody don't have this pest, or, well, let's put it the other way. Have you have any of this pest on your, on your high tuna? So, so I, I, I think that's, uh, that's a good information. Now, once you identify your pest, you know what it is, and you know that you should apply that, in, uh, or you should do something, you, you will decide whether you apply an, a pesticide or you release some natural enemies. If you decide to use pesticide, and when I say pesticide, it can be organic pesticide, right? So in case you're thinking about, I don't use, are you use a synthetic insecticide or anything? So, but anyway, if you decided that you want to use pesticides, then again, come back to this book. So in this case, I choose these aphids and tomatoes, and you can see all the different products that all these universities around the Mill uh, Atlantic have seen that is, that is effective, that they are effective. So 
we don't get paid for these people, for, we don't get paid for these companies. So these are based on research that we have done and we know that they are effective. And they will give you based on that pace that you have over there too. So in this case, this is aphids, but if you see in the bottom over here, there are more information there about caterpillars, which are different. But if you say, well, I want to use organic pesticides. So you just have to Google IR4 biopesticides. It will get you to this web page and then just go to the label uh, database. It looks like this. Okay, so then you choose whatever you, your crop is. So in this case, I put that is fruit, vegetable group, tomatoes, and I put that is an AP problem. And you can choose whatever you have over there. And then you just go search and it give you all these different options for aphids. So all these are, paid. you don't try to read it because I, I know you won't be able to do it, but once you're in the computer, you obviously can choose. Most of these over here are uh, oils and some of other organic uh, products. So now, if you decide to use biocontrol agents, then there are many, many different places where you can buy those. So here is a few of them. I won't go or mention all of them, but they are in alphabetic number over here from A. If you can see, you just get to E over here, there are more over here. So there are a bunch of different places where you can buy different uh, different biocontrol agents. And maybe next year I can talk about yeah, the that different website. biocontrol Is agents. Is that in the IR4 website too, that list of where you can buy them? No. Okay. No, but I can send you that so you can share the, the, the okay, list. Absolutely. So, from now on, I have 10 more minutes, so I will focus on most of the important pests. Let's start with aphids. So, aphids, how many of you can distinguish an aphids? Okay, a lot of people. Well, I have some aphids over here. Yesterday, they were green. Now, they're in alcohol, so they're a different color. But the point is, you can see... Um, the sizes, they, the sizes will, will uh, change. <laughs> so uh, the way that you can distinguish aphids uh, that none of the insects are is uh, these little parts over here. And um, sometimes, if that aphis is big, you can see it. If not, you have to see it in the microscope. But anyway, aphids have this mouth part that they introduce in the plants and they just suck a lot of the sap of the, of the plant. And that has to come on in the other way, and that's why they produce a lot of honeydew. So honeydew is basically insect poop, right? So something important about aphids is that they also can transmit diseases. So by the aphids taking a lot of nutrients from the plants and transmitting the seeds, they can destroy your crop. Here we can see that aphids uh, can feed in both uh, buds, leaves, stems, even roots, you name it. So there are obviously different type of, different species of aphids. So they will, different species will feed on different plants and also on the different part of, of, the, of the plant as well. How you see that, sometimes you, how to monitor it then, sometimes you see these little uh, white flecks. Those are basically the skin of the aphids. So as you know, insects don't have bones like we are. So they have exoskeleton. So the bones of that insects are their skin. So in order insects to grow, they have to remove their skin. So, and these are basically kind of like the uh, aphids skin that we see sometimes when we have a lot of them. We also can notice ants because ants are looking for the honeydew. They, they feed on the honeydew as well. And 
I have some thresholds over here. Uh, this threshold will depend on the plant, will depend on the crop, but also will depend on your decision. But these are some information I got from uh, Florida University where they recommend to treat the plant, tomato plants when they have two to three aphids per plant. So, but the way that you uh, count that is if you have plants that have less than two leaves, then you see the entire plant. But if you have bigger plants, more than two true leaf, then you just look at the third leaflet on the leaf number three or seven from top, okay? And if you have three to four aphids per plant, then you should do something about it. So that means that it's time for you to apply a pesticide or to, re to release some natural enemies. The aphids that you saw right there is the green peach aphids. Like I said yesterday, it was green. Uh, tomatoes, uh, you feed on tomatoes, pepper, eggplants. Then you have here uh, some cabbage aphids. You can see the colors are different right here. This one produces some kind of wasps, wax pro, uh, material on their body, which makes them a little, a little more uh, tolerance to oils products, for example. So sometimes you have to apply several times uh, oil to control them. But there are others, for example, here we have a melon aphis and a potato aphis right here. And we have natu uh, natural enemies. In this case, we have uh, ladybugs. This is how they look in the larva stage. I already seen of the ladybugs over there. We have over here some uh, minute parrot bugs. They're very small, I actually have some some of them over here, I think. Just give me a second. Good. Well, I, I don't find that, but I have other things over here that why it's important to identify the pest. And I will send you three different boxes. In one box, you will have the squash bug. How many of you have problem with the squash bug over here? So squash bug is a big problem on squash and many other cucumber plants. Then I will send you another that is called leaf-footed uh, bug. So please make sure to see the, the uh, back leg of these insects. So that's the way you will identify this one from the squash bug. And then I will send you some good guides over here. These are natural uh, predators. There are the wheel, wheel bug and assessing bug. So I will send the three of these together so you can see how difficult or, or easy it might be to identify that, that insect, depending on, on how you see it. So, um, these ones right here, these are lace queen. I don't know if you're aware, but you can buy lace queen in internet, and you can buy it on eggs stage, you can buy it on the larva stage, or in the adult stage. So in the egg stage, they will come, they will come like this material like here, and basically you just put uh, some of these on your plants and then the eggs will hatch and the larva will move and eat uh, or they uh, will eat aphids for example or white flies. In the larva stage please notice that each of these have a different cell and the reason they have a different cell is because they are so good eating that they can eat each other. So uh, they will eat whatever is smaller than them. So that's and they like to eat a lot. So, and the adults also, um, you can buy that in the adult stage. I believe I have some adults. Yes, I have some adults over here. And I also find my find my Oreos that might not parrot bugs over here. So I will send this with you. Those are the Oreos. They are, they're marked. So there is a lot of stuff that I'm sending there. They're the same. So just. And I will also send the lace wing adults over here. You can buy the adults 
I don't recommend buying the adults. The reason is adults have wings, so that means they will fly away. So I recommend you to, if you don't have problems yet, so if you have problems in the past, like last year, and you, you think, okay, I want to buy some natural enemies, so I would recommend you to buy it in the egg stage. If you have problems already, I would recommend you to buy the larva stage, because then you can have a faster control. There are parasitoid wasps that will help you to control uh, either aphids or white flies. So the way how it works is this, well, I, will, I will pass it because I don't think I have a lot of time now. Um, let me see if I have it. They're very small. Yeah. I, I'm not expecting you to see this insect. I just, you to have an idea how small they are. Uh, but these ones over here, for example, I'll, I'll sell on, this, on these bottles like this. This actually, I bought this like three months ago. And there's supposed to be 500 insects over here. And the way they work is these adults will mate and want the male, the female will go and lay down eggs on the aphids. Their eggs will hatch and then the larva will eat inside of that aphids and this is what you see on your high tunnel. You see the aphids that are bigger than the other ones and are colored brown and they're rounded. Those are called mummified aphids. And then that, that adult will come out from there and will complete the life cycle. And that's what you see over there, the very, very small wasp. These are some of the pesticides that you can control, uh, use to control aphids. For aphids, I just recommend you to use uh, soap or oil. There are other more toxic uh, insecticides right here. That's, the, that's your call, what you want to use. However, if you use soap on, uh, or, or oil, make sure that it's not hot outside. So if you apply these products when it's 90 degrees or more outside, you will kill your plant. So make sure to apply these products when it's less than 90, 90 Fahrenheit. Okay, so for white flies, I, the last I, I will pass over here is, and I will end with this because I don't have time. These are some um, encarcia parasitoids, and this is the way they sell it. The black thing that you see over there, that you will see over there, there are white flies that have been parasitized, and the adults were in there, and then the adults will come out and will do the job and put their eggs in, in other white flies. That's how you buy it. So, but anyway, I will be around. Do I have time for questions? Yeah, any questions? How much do these biologicals generally cost? Well, they're very cheap. The expensive part is the shipping. Because okay. some of them might be in California, for example, and then they like to overnight it because, you know. Uh, but usually they ship for like 50 bucks, and then depending on how many you buy, so it can cost like 20 to 30 bucks for like or, or depending on that insect, yeah. Does that book have uh, helped you identify some of those minor? Uh, no, no, the book only give you the name. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So what I recommend is once you know what you're going to plant, like for example, you say I'm going to plant tomatoes, right? So go to this book. See what are the pests, the most important or the most common pests on, on, on this area. And then just use Google. So use, like for example, say aphids, just go and say aphids on tomatoes and you will see them or whatever pests that you see there, uh, you, it's easy to find it in the internet. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first question is, 
If we do something on the greenhouse to keep our natural enemies inside, right, or alive, uh, that's a really good question. There is basically no reset on natural enemies on, on high tunnels. I know for some growers it works. Uh, they release this parasitoid was that I'm sending, and it was he didn't have anything, but. Uh, I actually right now doing a research uh, using some screens in, in, the, in, in the high tunnel just to see what is that effect on the biological control. But no, I don't have any recommendation because there is no research that I have read. The other question is, there are other websites about the pesticides in West Virginia. The IR4 that I give you, that um, the website, those are based on uh, federal regulations. So that means there are, there can be used in any state, but within some states, like California, New York, they have uh, higher regulations. So all that pesticides that can be used in any of the, in, in, that are approved by the EPA can be used in all the states. But some states like California and New York will say, no, you cannot use this over here. And West Virginia don't do that. So if they're over there, they're, they'll be safe to use. Okay, thank you so much. I will, okay, last question. Just wondering what your thought was. If you get like a, some kind of worm every year and in, your, in your crop, different kinds of worms, um, be a full-time worker and overwork and all that, do you, do you recommend the uh, organic uh, um, pre-spring if you know you're going to get them and you know they're going to get your leaves in your crops, you get them every year, do you spray before you have the problem so that when they show up, they eat the leaf and they die? Well, I think that's the easiest way to do it. I do not recommend that. The reason is, if they're there and they're a problem all the time, is because by spraying all the time, you're also reducing the natural enemies. So it depends what it is, I would recommend to release on natural enemies if you are in the high tunnel or a, a greenhouse. If you're outside, it's a little more difficult, but I will say uh, for caterpillars, for example, you can use BT, Bacillus surgensis, or DPEL. How many DPEL is Bacillus surgensis? So it's a bacteria that you can that is very effective against uh, worms, and you can apply that once you uh, know that that insects are in there. I do not recommend. I recommend that, but you know, like you make your own decisions. That's what my recommendation is. Check for them first. Thank you so much, Ed. Carlos came from Morgantown today, so we really appreciate him traveling down to see us today. Uh, right, Brandy? Yeah. Brandy is the extension agent in Roan County, so we're really excited to have her come down here. Um, she does a great presentations. I've seen her present several times, and super nice to talk to. So if you get a chance and can grab her ear about something, I'm sure she'd love to talk to you. And she's going to talk about starting seeds. Uh, it's very important to uh, think about doing this for your high tunnel because... A lot of times when you want to plant, the nurseries won't have plants available for you. So this is a great option to think about. Here you go. All right. I want to thank you guys for having me. Oops. Fix me. Okay. I want to thank you for having me down to the southern part of the state. If you're ever up in my neck of the woods, I'm kind of tucked between the two interstates of uh, 77 and 79. One tiny part of our county in Ama, West Virginia, touches uh, 79. Uh, but to get to us, you can either get off 77 at Ripley and come over on 33, or you can get off the Clendenin exit, which is northern northern um, Kanawha County, and follow 119 into Spencer. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about seed starting. As Corinne said, um, it's really important to get the varieties that you want, and we'll, we'll talk more in depth about that. Um, this is my commercial and I feel obligated to, to talk about, you know, if you really want a useful tool, our garden calendar does talk about when to start seeds, um, when, to, when to plant certain vegetables and crops, um, even some shrub, shrub maintenance in there. So if you don't have a copy of the garden calendar, I would highly recommend it. It's downloadable online and also we have them at the extension office. It's kind of getting late in the year, so you might not find a hard copy. So, oh good, Crenn still has a few. 
So I try to break it up a little bit with humor breaks. So um, I only have 30 minutes, so I can't be very humorous today. So we're, we'll kind of go through that because I tend to get long-winded and give myself a chance to breathe and you all a chance to think. Um, but we'll go ahead and just get right into the topic of um, why you want to start your own seed. First of all, it's really rewarding to see something start from scratch. Um, it's a very good way to save money or also make money. Specifically, if you're, if you're using high tunnels um, to grow your own fruits and vegetables, you want to do that for self-sustaining purposes or you want to do that for markets that you might have. And a lot of times um, getting those plants that your consumers want can be quite expensive. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot of equipment. You can use various um, applications and, and containers to um, get started with seeds. Um, you can plant the varieties that are otherwise unavailable. You look at these great seed catalogs and you think this is going to be a nice variety or you listen to Lewis Jett, our um, commercial horticulture specialist, talk about the recommended varieties and then you have trouble finding them locally. So this is a great opportunity to to make that happen for yourself. And then you also get a jump start on spring planting. Um, looking around at this farm, it looks like they've got a lot of options in addition to the high tunnel. They have some low tunnels and caterpillar um, screens and, and pest management controls. So, and raised beds even over on, on that side of the road. So I think they've got a lot of things that will help um, get an early start on growing plants. And then just um, the thought of growing plants for fall and winter gardens, it's not usually um, something that you see locally. Uh, you get a few varieties of cabbage and your cold crops, but if you really want to uh, um, have a variety in these high tunnels and um, they are set up to grow on the off seasons, you're going to have to be become proficient at growing your own seeds or partner with somebody who is good at starting seeds and, and, and putting those in the in the soil um, so some tips if you just if you uh, are going to try to sow your own seeds you're going to need a location that's indoors that allows for sufficient light and air temperature you want to select seeds from the recommended varieties and as a made gave a commercial our uh, earlier our website has a list of varieties that WVU um, commercial Port specialists and home port specialists would recommend because they have uh, disease resistance and are more viable in, in our state. Um, this alone saves a lot of trouble down the road. Um, you're going to use a soilless mis mixture in most cases, uh, and these um, mixtures are intended for seed starting. I'll give you an example in a picture later. You don't want to use the garden soil because it's going to contain weed seeds, possibly diseases, or other uh, problems with uh, being too heavy and, and, and having that poor drainage. And then um, the other thing you want to consider is choosing containers. A variety of them's out there and, and all of them will work. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the advantages and disadvantages later. But the most important thing is to have that good drainage and I'll like belabor the water amount to death in this presentation. So um, when do you start seeds indoors? Well, the proper time to sow your seeds are, depends on when you want to safely move them outdoors or actually um, with a high tunnel workshop, you have that advantage of, of putting them in, in, in an indoor space. I will say there's too much air movement in just an open high tunnel to, to have um, that be your seed starting chamber. So you kind of have to make your own little space in the high tunnel that has that extra protection from the wind and temperature. Um, <gasps> fluctuations to get your seeds growing well so very um, it will vary according to the crop and the date of the last frost now I know in our neck of the woods we always use mother to stay it's just been a, a very easy um, easy frost date to go by but we all know we have those early frosts and late frosts so it's just something to pay attention to the weather service and their average frost dates for your um, soil and your area so is that about right for your neck of the woods as well and then you're going to count back to the weeks um, from the last frost date and this typically goes uh, uh, six to eight weeks before the last frost date and that's when you're going to put your seeds in the in the mixture um, a common mistake is to say sow your seeds too early and then attempt to hold the seeds back under poor light or poor temperatures um, you know this is going to result in more spindly looking plants that are weak um, and they just don't really perform well. So if you're really 
uh, want to have a healthy garden, you have to start with a healthy start, and the transplant is very vital. A healthy transplant is vital. Um, you want to end up with a really stocky plant, so the more room you can give the roots to grow, the better. A lot of commercial growers will use plug trays, and that's just to maximize their space and get the, you know, if they have a limited area to, to get those plants. So, um, one good thing we all know where we probably have, probably know if we've grown tomato plants before, if those get too leggy, you can always bury them in the ground and, and you have a little forgiveness. Most transplants require to be planted at the soil depth of the plug or the um, cell pack that you have. So, when to start them indoors? Uh, there's two different types of crops, cult cool season crops and warm season crops. Um, you can start those cool season crops. Of course, this is if they were going outdoors. If you're um, talking about high tunnel seeding, you can get into um, January and February uh, or early March to begin your, your seeding for those cool season crops. And you can plant lettuce at, at about the same time, but you wanna make sure that you're seeding those in about two to three uh, week intervals. That way you have um, you have your, your harvest um, coming due at, at different times for your lettuces and other greens. Warm season crops such as cucumbers, melons, squashes, pumpkins, they're gonna require probably two to three weeks before planting outdoors in May. So you would back that up by, you know, about a three week period to, to a month period um, for your high tunnel. Um, tomatoes take about five to six weeks before planting and peppers and eggplants uh, need anywhere from five to eight weeks. And the nice thing is we're going to talk a little bit about seed um, seed packets and the information that they provide. Um, this is a nice ch chart to show you the temperature. Uh, temperature is a big thing in your soil um, and there's some things that you can do to heat your um, soilless mixture, your mixture, seed starting mixture to get it to the temperature needed. Um, we have these charts available on the WVU Extension website in more detail. Um, and what's also important, there are some seeds, uh, and as you can see, there's not many, that will require either darkness or light to actually germinate. Um, so you need to pay attention to the light requirement as well. And on a lot of cases, it, it, um, crops will allow you to use either um, dark or light to germinate. But once they germinate, they're going to need that light for the photosynthesis to take place in the leaves. So when we talk about purchasing seeds, um, again, I've mentioned you want to make sure you choose severe, superior cultivars and high quality seeds buy from reputable um, companies. Um, a lot of times people like to save their seeds and that's okay as long as you know you don't have a lot of diseases going on and um, you can even choose heritage seeds if that's the market you're growing for, if that's the type of crops that you're um, wanting to have for, for your own consumption. But um, you can purchase those from local dealers. I don't know what um, seed companies or, or hardware stores you might have in this area that, that sell those seeds, but for best, best results, you want to make sure it's a reputable um, company. And one way you can um, test if the seeds are, are actually uh, quality before you um, so a whole bunch is do a germination test on any saved seeds that you have. Um, and then the other resource that we've really um, become de dependent on is the mail order or, uh, you know, catalogs that we get in the winter months that really make us hungry for the spring season to start up. Um, but I will say if, if you're ordering online or, or through these catalogs, order early because the popular varieties that maybe people want to say this is the trendy thing you're going to start with um, this year you want to make sure and get those um, soon because they do sell out and it's unfortunate when you really want to try a new variety and it's not available to you. So um, if you're talking about purchasing seeds uh, just keep in mind that if you're using fresh seeds they're going to germinate faster than old seeds. It's not to say old seeds won't germinate, they might not have the higher percentage of germination. So um, you, the good thing you can do is consult the seed packet. Um, usually seed packets will have the following information, the days to germination, the planting depth, um, seed spacing, row spacing, any type of cultural information that might be needed, disease resistance, and the number of days to maturity. Now that varies, not every seed packet is going to have all that information. 
but um, you're going to look for seeds that have as much detail as possible or in the catalogs have that descriptions available. Um, this is just an illustration of a back of a seed pack that tells you kind of like, let me see. You know, you can see the, the, um, what the actual seeds are going to be, a little description about them. Uh, I like this little chart here. It kind of gives you the pl um, planting depth, spacing, germination, thinning, um, how, how much uh, space after thinning you should have indoors or outdoors when planting, and then when and where to plant. Um, this also has care, harvesting, and even some health information. This is like the, the golden the golden seed packet I would say it has a lot of quality information on that little container. Um, where to purchase seeds? These are some um, companies that, and this is not an endorsement, but these are some companies that uh, a lot of our producers have uh, relied upon in the past for some heritage seeds, Southern Seed, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Baker's Creek Heirloom Seeds is a good resource. I know probably many of you have heard of Johnny Seed Company, Burpees. Those are just examples of some seed catalogs, and um, they're always trying to do their own research and come out with varieties. They actually work um, some with the universities as well in providing um, specialists and agents with um, trials to see what varieties are going to do well in different um, climates and areas. I'll just put this chart up here because I like a good... Uh, infographic that kind of um, gives you an idea of different different and this is probably more for my neck of the woods than, than your neck of the woods is zone five y'all are probably a little bit warmer what's uh what zone anybody six, six? okay <clears throat> and this is dependent because we have several microclimates and our climate has kind of shifted to where we could grow a little bit more uh, but this gives you just an idea for zone five things that you can put. So that means if you can grow those in zone five, they're going to be in your high tunnels in the in the cool season. Um, and that includes the vegetables, the herbs, and then flowers. I'm not a, a flower grower myself, so I really, if you come to ask me any varieties on, on these different flowers that are up here, I can't really help you out with that. But um, there are there is a big market if you're looking to use your high tunnel to um, grow flowers, cut flowers especially. So um, a starting medium, uh, a good starting medium, I have this example up here, what you need to look for when you go to purchase one, if you're going to purchase, it'll say seed starting on the container. Um, it needs to be really light and airy. What I mean by airy, just really lightweight. Um, it'll have a lot of uh, water absorption properties. Um, and uh, it'll be full of, of um, things like peat moss, uh, vermiculite, and perlite. Um, these materials can be, mi or can be purchased separately, and you can make your own mix. But, I mean, the affordability of these mixtures, I would advise just, just you know, buying it commercially. And until you get a little more skill level or, or you have some greenhouse, you know, growing experience. Um, when you're thinking about um, starting your seeds from scratch, you're going to think you're going to need some fertilization, um, but it's going to depend on the medium. And many mixes now that you buy commercially has have um, already added uh, fertilizers, and they're slow release, so they give the nutrients to the seedlings and the and the new plants that that are needed because you don't want to give them too much fertilize, as um, Evan was saying earlier, too too young in life. So, as I mentioned earlier, you do not want to use garden soil by itself because it does um, tend to be too heavy and it's not sterile. Now, there is a process where you can sterilize your, your soil and make your own mixtures. Um, but um, a good germination medium needs to be loose and well-drained and fine textures and free of any of the harmful microorganisms. Uh, this Pro Mix is a, a lot of uh, greenhouse growers will use a product like this that has uh, the microbial, uh, antimicrobial um, additive into it to where um, it helps with the dampening off of seedlings. That's a real problem uh, in starting seeds. So um, when you are going to get your, your um, seedlings ready to put in a container, you want to fill up 
your soil, your mixture up to about a fourth of an inch to the top of the rim and make sure it's a moist medium. Um, large seeds can be sowed directly into pots or cell packs. You don't need just an open tray. Um, an example of those might be squash or cucumbers. Um, you can use a pencil to make the little divots or holes to put those in if you're doing the direct seeding. Or you can do a broadcast seed of, of smaller seeds and then thin them out later when you transfer them into a larger cell pack. Uh, used to be I saw four count, or I mean six count uh, cell packs. Now pretty much commercially all you can find is the four pack because it just gives them a little more uh, um, room to grow and get a stronger transplant I think. Um, smaller seeds tend to scatter over a large cell, cell pack and you can you can transplant those later. You want to make sure and um, spread it over that um, potting, um, potting mixture and you can even add some um, sphagnum moss to help prevent the dampening off. Um, the small seeds and of course we know this from our outdoor gardening if you have like a carrot seed or something that's really tiny or hard to see you can mix it in with some cornmeal or some um, sand or sugar uh, to help see what your distribution is so you're not spreading it out too thick and wasting your seeds. So here's some common soilless mixtures that are available. Um, they have benefits and um, drawbacks. Um, I do have a copy of these slides. I'll let Corinne pass them around here after I get finished talking. I didn't want everybody looking through the slides while I was talking. Um, to where you can add this to your um, to your own uh, mixture or if you need to uh, make your soil a little more airy. So before uh, before you planting in the soil uh, medium or in the growing medium, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you need to fill the seeds almost to the top, uh, leaving some head space for watering, uh, anywhere from a fourth to three quarters of an inch, and then firm the medium with your fingers or a block of wood. Uh, a lot of uh, growers like to use that block of wood and and just level off the soil. Um, and the general rule of thumb, and I know you've probably seen this in other places is um, no you don't want to put the seed no further than two uh, times that diameter of the seed so some of those seeds are teeny tiny and they just require a little peck from or lightly dusting of your hand over the top of the mixture what's nice about most seed packets it will even give you um, a, de a description of the of the soil depth that you'll actually need so uh, other tips that you might think about, they need to be warm and they need to be, seeds need to be warm to germinate. They also need moisture. You never want to get your soil medium dried out. You also don't want to drown your soil medium. Um, temperatures need to range anywhere from 65 to 70 degrees, your soil temperature. Um, and you need to make sure you're in a location that does not have a lot of um, wind or, or, you know, like a fanning of a door opening a lot. Um, so that continuous supply of soil, uh, or that continuous supply of water and constant temperature will ensure the health of your, your seed because if you ever had a um, seed embryo to dry out, it's, it's, it's gone. Um, a lot of folks, and I think I have this later in the slides, but I get ahead of myself sometimes, um, use a little spray bottle to just, um, you can buy from the Dollar Tree or something, a little um, hand sprayer like you use for your household cleaner and use that because it's a fine mist that you can spray over the top of the soil surface. Um, the other thing you might want to think about is the humidity you know, for those plants. If you can increase the humidity and the temperature by adding a cover or either plastic, the only thing you don't want to do is, um, is uh, make have the plastic come in direct contact with the soil. You need to raise it up so it doesn't um, suffocate your plants or, or put too much weight on them. You can buy heating pads uh, and set your containers on to warm the growing meeting, medium and this will help speed up the germination process. Um, and this is just a little bit about what um, the different uh, factors in um, seed starting are doing. The moisture actually is penetrating the seed coat allowing the endosperm to um, swell and the, the seed coat will split and it actually dissolves the nutrients to initiate the germination process. Um, once it begins, uh, once this water, 
seed germination begins uh, with the water absorption, you are going to need ad adequate and continuous supply of water. Um, and it can, it, oh, I already mentioned the, the death of the embryo. So um, that plastic spray mister, that spray bottle will be your best friend in, in starting seeds. Um, light, as I mentioned earlier, will help either stimulate or inhibit germination. So be sure to check your seed packet or your catalog uh, for planting instructions there. Um, and then the oxygen is required for respiration. Um, this helps facilitate this is facilitated by really um, well aerated and uh, loose planting medium. Here is an example of a picture over here of a of a seedling heat pad. It's basically like a heating pad you get in your in your home if you have a backache, but um, it's about the size of a tr of a um, seed tray, uh, and it really just that heat really um, helps drive the met metabolic process. Um, a lot of times these are also available through those through those um, dealers that sell other seed and greenhouse products. Um, just a note to think about on um, whether or not, if it's an unfamiliar crop, so say you've never raised um, you know, basil before and you're not sure if it should be a warm season or a cool season crop, if you just kind of read the the packet when the temperature uh, the temperature does not drop below 65 there you know it's going to be a warm season crop you, it can be started four to six weeks um, before planting outdoors um, we talked about watering I don't want to belabor it but um, what you want to make sure is kind of like the Goldilocks method as you to your touch if it's if it's um, if there's no moisture to the touch it's too dry if it's soaking wet it's, it's too wet and you just need that just right um, touch of, of soil or of moisture on your um, seed starting medium. Um, make sure you maintain that consistent amount of moisture throughout the time that you have your plants um, uh, growing into, into strong transplants. Um, this is this is dampening off. Um, just a little note. Um, it's the death of the seed before germination of a young plant or soon after its emergence. It's caused by a disease that affects young plants um, and is most damaging when the medium is too moist. So moisture is not always your friend, so you got to get it just right. And it takes a little skill. I'll be um, the first to confess I'm not a great um, plant or seed starter. I actually work with a local uh, greenhouse in my area, so this might be something you do. If you're just starting out, you work with somebody who is good at um, starting plants and you give them the seeds that you want for them to start for you and then you start trying to experiment on a smaller scale um, on your own. Uh, containers, we, we uh, I, I said there's several of them out there. I'm not going to go through the different things, but I will say my, my granny used to save every cottage cheese, uh, you know, yogurt container, whatever we had in the house, she was saving it to put a seed in in the spring and I thought it was a little maddening when I was younger but I realize now um, how expensive these things can be so it worked out but the main thing I'll say if you are using recycled household containers be sure to um, sterilize those um, always can use bleach one 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 to ten uh, solution um, they have a lot of good commercial products that involve that include peat, peat pots uh, they will Make sure that whatever container you choose, if you're going to keep your plant in there till where it's, you know, you know, six inch transplant, that it has enough um, space in it to give good root development for that transplant. Um, if you do, when you are transplanting, there's going to come a time when you have to thin them out or remove them. That's when the plants are very delicate. You don't want to tug on the stems. Uh, it's nice to have a little tool like a little knife. I forget the name of this, but it's a greenhouse tool that you can just... Um, pluck the plants out and move them around to your um, cell packs. Uh, the one thing I want to say about uh, lighting, and I, if you don't have enough light or you try to use your window seal, these uh, plants have a natural tendency to go to the light and this is a good way to tell if they're not getting adequate light. If they start going this way or that way or every which way and you're having to turn your containers, you're probably not giving an adequate light. It's really inexpensive to get a fluorescent light so um, I don't know where that's at my slides I just know I'm running out of time so um, 
just as a rule of thumb, you can get uh, fluorescent lights, cool bulbs. Uh, be sure that they're uh, no more than four inches above the tops of the plants. That way that they're not reaching and getting too spindly too soon. And make it to where if you are using fluorescent light, you can raise that. And I would highly recommend that you can raise it as the plants grow. So you're always keeping that constant height right above the plants. Um, oh, there we go, lights. I'm going to flip through some of these. Um, if you are going to use a window or you're outdoors in your high tunnel, just make sure you've got plenty of that light, and, and that's going to be something you're going to, have to, you're going to have to play with because light's a fickle thing. You think you've got enough light coming through that plastic. Uh, I would still, even, even in a high tunnel, recommend that fluorescent light just to have a healthier, healthier start for your plants. Um, the, the high intense timers are really inexpensive. Uh, your plants are usually going to require at least 12 hours of light per day, up to 16 hours. So you can get an inexpensive timer and put that on your light system. And that way you're making sure your plants are getting plenty of, plenty of that light. Um, if you are using grow lights to 40 uh, watt cool, um, light fluorescent tube bulbs um, you can purchase those as long as they're you know two to four inches from the top of the plants providing at least 12 hours of light per day um, and they should be raised there's my spray bottle that I mentioned earlier um, just just keep in mind too much water is going to make your seeds rot so if you don't have success don't don't give up just try it again and uh, make sure your water is room temperature you want to um, not make it too hot or, or too cold on your young tender plants. Fertilizer, um, you're going to use half of what you would with your, your um, once, you, once you see the first true leaves, uh, you can use a water soluble house plant fertilizer and there's some different combinations out there but you want to use at the half the recommended rate of what you would use in the field or the high tunnel and then you're going to fertilize in a two to three week interim so you're probably only going to do it a couple times um, when you go one important thing before I um, before Corinne just kicks me off stage here uh, is um, the hardening off of the plants you really need to think about that and that's the process of getting them acclimated to the different temperatures fluctuations even out of the growing chain chamber that you have set up in your high tunnel um, to the high tunnel uh, they need to be moved from that protective environment into maybe um, either outdoors or in your high tunnel for so many hours per day when it's not really, really bright, when it's not uh, really windy. Um, anything that's going to stress them out for a couple weeks just to get them prepared. Um, plants should be moved to a 45 to 50 degree temperature indoors and outdoors and in a shady location so as long as it's a well vented like cold frame or there's some kind of shelter or shade cloth um, you can put those out and uh, make sure you bring them in at night even cold hardy plants will um, be hurt or stunted if they're exposed to freezing temperatures before they're hardened um, once they're hardened off, you can put these um, seeds into your, or you can put these seedlings or young transplants into the garden. Uh, just, and I keep saying garden, but it's high tunnels. Uh, just make sure that you do it when the when the light intensity of the sun's not the brightest. So, at the end of the day is the is a perfect time, or a cloudy day in, in the afternoon as the sun has passed its peak, which is usually like six six in the evening. Um, if transplanting the uh, peat pots. Make sure you trim the pots down to the soil level and you're just going to put your transplants in at the soil line of the root balls that you have. Um, there are other types of propagation besides just using seeds. So um, there's asexual where you can just take uh, parts of the plant and clone it. Um, there's stem cuttings there uh, where you take parts of the stem and just and stick them in the tips. That's in my slides. You all can read in more depth about it. There's cane cut, or the other types of stem cuttings include cane and heel cuttings, and it gives you little illustrations of how those actually can happen. Basically, if there's a node there, um, it can it can sprout roots, and if you use root, um, not inhibitor.
root uh, yeah root hormone <laughs> I was gonna say inhibitor no, no yes uh, it will also um, increase your chances of success with some of these cuttings um, leaf cuttings a lot of the succulents like the like the African violet jade plants do well with leaf cuttings whole leaves um, there's split vein cuttings which are a little trickier but this is just kind of when you get into playing and make make um, plants you know growing plants fun um, you can even actually take large roots and small roots and take sections of those and and grow plants I actually I was just an example uh, had some impatience out in my yard my the deer come and mowed them nicely for me um, they were still a little bit of stem at the bottom I just put them in and and what do you know the seed the the leaves are coming back it had enough enough there to to start with the roots um, tip layering you see this a lot with like strawberries and other vining plants um, there's there's um, different types of layering methods um, including the mounding methods for like um, there's even a, an, an, a way you can start a plant what they call air layering I've not actually tried it myself but if you take a node and you split it open um, and you wrap it with some with some moss um, you can get some root development use some of that root um, hormone and take off with take off once you get the cutting once you get it established um, Stalins and runners are a great example of how you get little baby plantlets and you can just trim them off of the mother plant and get you a new plant and then you can always separate anything that has a bulb a quorum or if you've got just too too much of a cluster of the crown of something you could break it into sections and uh, get new plants that way I was trying to do that in record time I'm sorry my, my slides weren't as organized as I'd like them to be but uh, are there any questions about starting seeds or um, plant propagation yes we want to do the LED lighting and they start researching stuff online they have a lot of push information about color spectrum and what color you want up with your roots versus house plants versus garden uh, and you're saying just stand, stand for some light yeah i would uh, as a beginner have you done any growing of the different no, plants before i didn't want to do led i'm a let um oh okay so i kind of want to i want to go through the led route for cost savings and efficiency I do not have any personal light preferences or recommendations. I can ask or ask our specialists and see if they have any. Harry, have you had any experience? Or just white, broad spectrum. Full light spectrum. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm having trouble getting pepper seeds to germinate. And you're using, well, I mean, pep different varieties. Actually, this year I used some of the sage seeds. They actually germinated better than the new seeds that I purchased. Hmm. I don't know. If Have you done some germination tests with the seed that you're using? I mean, that might be. We do use Promix, but I was going to ask you what's the uh -huh. difference between Promix and HP. I've never seen that. Um, I don't know. I think they both have anti uh, antimicrobials that's going to help with the dampening off. Yeah. I just always, Harry's a good resource for all of extension, so when he's in the crowd, I'm going <laughs> to pick on him. Exactly. So on the peppers, I mean, they do take a while. Um, just think about their growing season. They're one of the longest growing seasons that we have in the vegetable world, so maybe be patient but have you had a time when they were they germinated quicker and this is just a new thing or this is just your first experience um, no it's, it's not a new thing I mean, okay that's just just the seeds that I'm not doing right I mean if soil temperature correct uh, don't plant them no more than a quarter of an inch you know, yeah deep. you're not getting them too deep and I mean, light doesn't come in the factor until they actually, you know, come up. You know, you start to see the leaves. So, um, air. I mean, <laughs> if you're not having any air fluctuations, uh, 
and it's not getting too cool in your in your growing area, I don't have any other recommendations. All right. Well, thank you. And here's my contact information, my email, my office number. Feel free to call me or reach out to me if you have any questions about other horticultural products. Thanks, Brandy. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker uh, is Harry Edwards. He is a sales representative for our area in, um, well, in West Virginia and, and throughout, I think, the Northeast. Um, we don't necessarily promote any particular manufacturer, but I can tell you that Rimmel has a great tunnel. Uh, we're glad that Harry comes down and, and talks to us about his project uh, products, and then also he's going to give you some ideas about accessories and different sizes and that sort of thing. So if you haven't purchased a high tunnel yet, uh, or if you're looking to add some things to your high tunnel, uh, Harry can uh, help you out with that. So Harry, if you want to come on up here. And Harry, where did you come from today, just so we, people know? Well, I know, but the where night before, I'm where are you from? Familiar with most Pittsburgh and, from yeah, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, here's Harry. Good morning. Um, great to see you all this morning. I am employed by Rimmel Greenhouses, but my passion is really supporting small farmers. I spent uh, six or seven years as a market farmer myself, and high tunnels were the only place where I made any money, so that's what I do now. Um, just a couple of things. I brought some catalogs that are in the back on the table. In my rush on the way out of town, I grabbed a full case, and they are three years ago catalogs. So sorry about that. There will be some uh, some swag out there, some Rimmel branded stuff. Uh, I've got hats and t-shirts. I would like to just start with Rimmel customers or somebody who's considering a Rimmel house right now. So I'll have those out after lunch. Um, I got some guidelines from Corinne about the uh, West Virginia um, NRCS program, and it's divided into two different award levels and two different structure sizes that are, are going to be um, granted. The two categories for the uh, for the funding are the experience grower, which Corinne, is that more than five years? Well, no, for the for the high tunnel grant. Oh, like, well, no, there's just a general, like anybody is eligible, but then if you're historically underserved. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Very good. So it is the, the historically underserved as a second category, and that covers beginning or limited resource or uh, socially dis historically socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, I put together some some guidelines based on everyone's standard uh, for something that will fit within a program. So this is what we're looking at. We're looking at growing crops in the ground in a structure that is large enough to be managed commercially mechanically. Uh, and this is your ultimate goal. You're looking to fill that up with crop that you can feed your family, feed your neighbors, and sell to make a little bit of extra income. The guidelines this year for a small square footage grant and that works out to be just a little bit more than, I used our model of a 22 by 48 North Point. So if you are working at that level, you're at 1057 a square foot, um, which is a really big jump from some previous years. It's gone down significantly over the years, and this year it has jumped up. Maybe last year was up a bit as well. Uh, if you fit into the other category, 1268, both of these grant levels will allow you to buy a complete package delivered. Uh, you'll need to put it up. So as an example of one thing that Rimmel sells, and again, Rimmel is not uh, sponsored by this, but we, we are happy to be here. I am happy to be here. Um, a high tunnel is typically includes, we call it a high tunnel because of the sidewall height at five and a half or six feet. That's a standard uh, height wall. That'll give you a lot of ventilation from the sides through the roll-up curtains. In this package I put together, you can have steel end wall framing with woven poly end walls the woven poly holds up better to the wind battering. This ends take a lot of beating, so the woven poly works out nicely, and it's just about the same cost as a polyfilm. It's a double layer of inflated poly. I put I put some some um, items in here that I would consider pretty critical to your high tunnel. Whether you build it yourself, you you, you put together things from um, online packages, or if you buy a package, NRCS likes you to buy a complete package. 
So a double layer of poly, a lot of people think about that as an insulating system, and it does do that, but the R value is really like one and a half. It's not a lot whether you're polycarbonate or double poly. One of the really major benefits of a double inflated layer of plastic is that you're creating almost bubble wrap. You're creating a, re a hard, rigid pocket of air so that wind blows and, and goes over it smoothly. It doesn't catch on it and beat it against the hoops, which can wear it out. And um, snow slides off of it a lot more easily. So a double layer, if you have electricity, I strongly recommend it. Your plastic will last longer. A single layer of poly on a windy site will beat all day. And you won't really hear it until you walk out of the tunnel and you'll be like, oh my god, it's quiet out here. <laughs> so if you can, go, go with double poly. Another really big issue that doesn't seem like a big one, but it really is. Double wire lock along the side. Uh, we sell, and a lot of other manufacturers sell as well, an aluminum extrusion that's about four inches wide. It runs the whole length of the house. It replaces what used to be used as a, a two by six wooden hip board with a piece of single wire lock channel on it. The problem with that is really, really significant. If you have that on your existing high tunnel, I strongly recommend you replace that hip board the next time you replace your poly. Because when the wind comes across a structure like this tent, it turns this tent shape into the shape of, it treats it like it is an airplane wing. An airplane wing is rounded on the top and is flat on the bottom. So when the w wind comes across it, it's forced to go up out of its natural path of straight. And that, that up creates lift. And as it gets over the other top, say, say the wind is coming from this side. As it comes from across the top, that wind now wants to go straight but there's this vacuum underneath it that it needs to fill. And when it comes down, it creates tremendous force right there, right along that line there. And what it wants to do is pull that up. The, the reason that, that most high tunnels fail is because that wooden hip board rots out before anybody notices it. And on a really windy day, those screws will pull right out of the single wire lock channel and your plastic will be flapping. And that's a disaster. So double wire lock channel is a really low cost insurance. Um, roll up curtains with gearboxes, you don't want to do without that. That's your primary ventilation um, option. The way that roll, that roll up curtains cool the most successfully is to put a shutter in your peak above the door on the end walls. And that lets the cool air come in the side and force the heat out of the peak. So that, that little area above the door is really critical also, and that's where I would put the motorized ventilation peak shutters tied to a thermostat. Um, pretty simple. If you don't, if you're building your own, you can build your own kind of a butterfly vent, but some kind of a peak ventilation option is gonna make a big difference. Uh, on this small package, there was also enough money included, so you could put a nice 4x7 single sliding door on the end. Um, we sell Rimmel cells, really good doors. They're not cheap, but they never fail. <laughs> they're, like, well, they're welded aluminum with polycarbonate, so really nice. Um, and if you'll notice the number at the bottom, 11161, due to the magic of creative accounting, that's exactly the grant vote total. If you are historically underserved, you can add some features, another door perhaps. Um, maybe you want to motorize and automate the roll-up curtains if you're away from the farm and you want to uh, have some automatic management. But this is a really nice start package. Uh, here, here's a picture of showing the, uh, the shutter above the door. That's really critical. And then this one has the motorized roll-up curtains on the side. I love that. It's not, it's like, the motors are just about the same cost as the, as the gearboxes. They're going to come in pretty close, a few hundred dollars more maybe. Um, but because they actuate incrementally, they open and close a few inches, and the cloud passes in front of the sun, temperature drops a little bit, it'll go down six inches, it'll stop, it'll wait a few minutes, it'll go down a few more minutes, a few more inches. And then when the sun pops back out, they don't notice that temperature and it gets back up a foot. And when I'm over weeding onions, I love to watch my tunnel being 
perfectly managed to an ideal temperature. So that's, a, that's an option. Here's just another option of the inside. This satisfies the uh, requirement for growing in the ground, but this is a way to eliminate your, uh, your weed issues, ground-to-ground uh, -ground row cover. Covering the large high tunnel grant, um, different, different, um, the encouragement this year is for, is towards smaller tunnels. So if you get a grant and you want to maximize that, you'll notice when I get into the next slide that the first smaller tunnel has a lot more nicer features, I would say. This, the bigger one just obviously gives you more commercial production space. Here we're about $6 and $7, and, um, but that's a $17,000 grant for a money printing machine. I would, I, this is why I love doing this. <laughs> Um, a 30 by 96 with the same sidewalls qualifies for that 2,880 square feet grant. On this one, because of the reduced uh, grant amount, 2 by 4 end wall framing would be the recommended way to, to get a, completely, a complete package delivered. Uh, if you want to go with steel framing or polycarbonate uh, end walls, of course those are also options. Same thing, double layer inflated poly, aluminum double wire lock, roll up curtains with gearboxes, and motorized peak shutters. This one does not have a door, it just couldn't, I couldn't fit it into the budget. Um, but if you want to, say, if you don't have electric to your site and you want to eliminate the double layer and go with a single layer of poly, there could be enough money left over for a door. This is why, this is why NRCS wants, to buy, wants you to buy a package. Um, Rimmel is based out of New Hampshire. We started building high tunnels. One of, one of our models is called a Nor'easter. That's what it does. I've, I've gotten pictures from West Virginia with 27 inches of snow on the roof. And the uh, first thing I said was, get out, and then go around the outside and knock the snow off. It's a, <laughs> it will hold a lot. It's, it's, it's the Roman arch shape, so it'll take tremendous force in a downward position. It does not like weight from the side. So if you don't move this this uh, snow blank, this snow drift away from the side, it can push it in from the side. Be very careful about that. That's why we say when you're putting up high tunnels, leave a dozen feet between them for airflow and for the place for the snow to go. But that's what the inside of the house looks like. So in the winter time, that is heaven. <laughs> to give you a little bit of a heads up, this is what a complete package looks like from Rimmel when it's ready to go in the truck. Uh, it's a 13 foot long crate, four feet wide, about four feet high. When that arrives on your farm, be ready, unless you talk to me and say, I need a short truck for this delivery, for all deliveries, it's gonna come on a semi. So be ready for that. It's, a short truck adds to the cost of the freight, maybe depending, usually a few hundred dollars. It doesn't, it doesn't double it, but freight's already about $1,900 to get it here. So we're looking at some real money. Just be ready. That's going to come. It looks intimidating. Two people can unload that in less time than it takes to really get that driver angry. So uh, be ready. Uh, you may, if you have extenders on your forks, on your uh, tractor or a, a tow motor, you could do it. You could take it off. It could, a hand truck if you have a neighbor business that has a dock where you could arrange the delivery, we do that. Uh, and the other thing is if you choose polycarbonate for the end walls, which is fairly common, this is what that crate looks like. It's six feet wide and typically about 17 feet long. That's significant. The way that we, that we, just, we just agree, or we just got an agreement with the manufacturer now that they're going to start making that a skid rather than just a crate because usually it's tied to the side of the truck wall and the way that you deal with it is you flop it over in the truck, it's always the last thing delivered, lay it over in the truck and pull it out until one end rests on the ground and then tell the driver to drive away. Because it is, it is very well crated. You don't, want it, you don't want it to drop on top of a big rock, but um, it'll be safe doing it that way. You can also open that up and unload it, unload it by hand. There's an example of a, a complete uh, all polycarbonate. This is an, a significant upgrade. I rarely do polycarbonate for farmers. 
polycarbonate is more typically for not-for-profits and schools because they can get capital money, but they can't get maintenance money. So $20,000 to them is not a problem. $1,000 is a problem. Uh, this shows ventilation shutters on the front and, uh, and the top. That's additional. But because this house won't have a roll-up curtain, on the other end of that house there are exhaust fans. So this is your intake. Here's, here's some shade cloth. Your end walls, say if you want, if this is going to be next to your house, I'm just getting, showing some creative ideas. If this is going to be next to your house or if this is going to be retail at some point in the future or if you're north facing, you could put an insulated wall on there. It's not going to cause any kind of deterioration. That shade cloth would be one of the first upgrades I would add to a West Virginia sale. If you can come up with $400 or $500 of your own money when you're getting $15,000, that would be the first place to start. When do you recommend applying that? The shade cloth? Yeah. After, after you get some germination and, and decent growth in the springtime, probably by June. Maybe, well, this is an unusual May, but mid-May in a lot of cases. We, we always recommend Memorial Day to Labor Day. Mm -hmm. That's just an easy way to think about it. Okay. That's my short and sweet sales pitch. Thank you for that. If I get to talk a little later today, I want to talk about some shade and cooling and some other things that you can do to manage your tunnel. Thanks, Eric. I have a Appreciate question. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. I have one question. Like uh, I have to have four high tunnels, Rimmel, Northeastern. The uh, little hangers, for example, like you hang the ropes on that go down to the, control the sidewall. Yes. I, it's very difficult to find those and find out how to order them from you. Well, it's not hard to get them from me, but I don't believe that is on our website, but our website will be revised. It is. I just got an email this morning from the new website. So in the next two months, I expect that to be on our website to buy, but email or call me and say you need another few of those hooks. I do. Okay. I'll send them to you. Okay. Thank you. That's my wife sitting there. Give her that email address oh, and she put it on her phone. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for Harry while we got him up here? He is sticking around, uh, I think, most of the day, and he's got some catalogs here on a table back here if you want to talk to him about uh, some different things. Um, and those, you know, costs that he was showing there, uh, it's great to kind of see, but, you know, our cost share rates are so good, even if you... You know, that's 17000 you know, if you have, I don't know how much does the court door cost, like 500 bucks or something, or seven eight, seven? Yeah. Okay. So you get a, a eighteen nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 structure for seven or $800. So, you know, think about that. Think about it like in those terms. So if you want a bigger tunnel, if that's your desire, go for it, is what I say every time, because I think you'll hear from some growers that say, go for it. But the smaller tunnels, tunnels are nice. If you have smaller areas and you just want to try it out and see how it goes, and then go for another one later. So I thank you. I thank you for those options, Harry. That was that was great. Thank you. So um, anyway, I think I like to ask Dorothy Stewart to come up and and chat first. Dorothy and Bill, who's our chairman, they've had uh, a high tunnel for what 11 or 12 years now. Was the first one. They now have three, and their daughter has another one. So there's a potential for actually growing in four. Dorothy has three full right now. So um, she's very uh, great inspiration, um, a hard worker, and I don't know how she gets it all done, especially having to, uh, you know, coordinate with Bill's schedule because he's pretty busy too. So Dorothy, tell us a little bit about what's going on at your place. Okay. Um, I, uh, as she said, I've had hot tunnels for 10 plus years and started out with one and I really enjoyed it. The beauty of it to me is I can work early morning, which typically for early morning might mean anywhere from 4 o'clock on. <clears throat> Particularly if you're going to pick beans, they're easier to pick in the morning before daylight with a headlight. You can see the beans on, on the vines and you can just pick them like ornaments on a Christmas tree. And that's... That's what I enjoy doing. I don't typically like to work midday because it gets too hot. If I can get up and work a couple hours in, in the morning, that'll pretty much take care of the maintenance for the day. But I like to start out 
uh, mid-March and I'll uh, plant in my tunnels. I kind of stick to the money crops uh, and a little bit of other odd stuff that, that we eat. Um, started with some broccoli and cabbage and peas this year and those will be in and out. In fact, the broccoli's gone now. Uh, and I'm going to replace the broccoli with uh, cucumbers. But I typically uh, stick with uh, t tomatoes, half runner beans, cucumbers, and one other thing that I enjoy an awful lot is the sugar cube cantaloupes. I have an awful lot of requests for them because they're extra sweet and people look forward to them. But it's kind of odd about those. Um, I initially had to sell those. Uh, I placed them out for sale and everybody just kind of walked by because they're just about softball size to about five inches or six. And they say, oh, they thought they were underground melons. But once they uh, took my advice and bought one, then they'd come back even later in the day and buy four or five at a time. So it got to the point where I was kind of known as the cantaloupe lady. People would see me at the grocery store in December and ask me if I still had cantaloupes. <laughs> but I, I've enjoyed those an awful lot. And I, I really do enjoy my tunnels. And it's difficult sometimes to get all the work done, but I just, uh, particularly since I'm getting older and I slow down a bit, but I manage somehow to get it done. In fact, last evening I went and uh, hoed some beans. Well, half rows all I could do, though I had to rest a while. But uh, we, get, we get it covered. I start out with one tunnel and get it going and then I'll go to the second one and then to the third one and then from there I have an outside garden as well but I have a variety of stuff that we market uh, eat all that we can eat and can what we want and market the rest typically I'll take uh, most of my stuff to Cerrito Market and that market opens in mid-June and lasts till October. And that's that's been a good outlet for us. And uh, I do sell some things to Williamson Market. Uh, Williamson has an awful good uh, uh, program with their wellness group up there. And they, they bought a lot of stuff from me last year. But marketing is not really my cup of tea. I can do it, but I would prefer to play in the dirt with everybody else do the marketing. I've got a question on your sugar cubes. Sure. I tried growing them last year in the hot tunnel and I didn't seem to get very good pollination. Do you do anything to encourage pollination or no, bring bees I in? Or? I actually had wonderful pollination. I have a, a group of uh, small bumblebees in my area that was, was really good. But I had really, really good pollination and good production. One of the things in uh, pollination is we like to plant <coughs> like cucumbers on the outside edge. They don't grow that high. And everything we grow, we grow up. We grow on tre trellis. Nothing lays on the ground. And that gives you uh, uh, probably three times more growing area by growing up. We grow on trellis. The cantaloupes grow on trellis. Uh, uh, everything. And uh, that, uh, that has been the greatest thing that we do. And you're reluctant to grow anything along your side curtains over there. We try to grow something that will bloom and have a lot of bees and things that come into it from the side instead of putting something there like beans that will grow up and block the airflow. You keep the short stuff over there and the tall boys and girls in the middle. Yeah, if I could add to that, I've, I've seen really good success with putting something like yarrow or uh, a lysium 
right along the outside of your high tunnel, so you're bringing those wasps right to that point, and then they're coming in. Beneficial kind of wasps. We also, on the outside, close by, we'll have the, uh, what's the bee? bee Butterfly bush? bushes. Butterfly bushes. Right. That brings pollinators around your high tunnel that can get in. And uh, they're very fragrant, yep. and they're covered up with your local bee crop. Bees don't come into them very much, but all of the other little bee families and things does, and we don't have much of a problem in pollination. An interesting thing, uh, for in the fall, I'll sow uh, a, lot, a variety of greens with kale and mustard and collards and just turnips, whatever, uh, and use that really as my cover crop. But this year I plowed half my garden and left the other half to grow. And the mustard flowered out so very pretty, and it has been the best pollinators that I've, I've ever seen. There's just butterflies, there's all kinds of bees, and I left that, in fact, uh, it's being plowed up now, but all the blooms are about gone. One of the things that I added this year that you might find interesting over here, I set up a little display for a uh, low tunnel. That's, we're trying to get, uh, see my, my tunnels don't have heat, and to start early in March, uh, for beans or anything like that, I need the soil temperature up. So I've, I got those low tunnels and they're just little metal bows. They're very easy to put up and I put it over my beans to warm, warm the ground and to give them uh, a boost. So that gives me a little bit of an extension on that because typically you'll put beans in the ground and they won't do anything because the temperature of the soil is not, not enough. But with the little low tunnel inside, uh, which is, is very, very easy to put up, and it takes you maybe 30 minutes to throw up a row of that, and the plastic uh, on the top of them, if you, if you look at the display over here, it has little air holes, so that uh, keeps the condensation down and lets the air flow through it, and even the wind, if it blows through the tunnel, won't won't blow that away, it'll just <coughs> fly up and settle back down. So that's uh, been an interesting thing this year. What kind of half runners do you grow? Uh, normally volunteers if I can find them. State half runners got to where they had too many flat beans. The, the second year, I, I don't always keep the best record, so, uh, but I specifically remember the second year in my tunnel one, I had 56 bushels of beans out of five rows in that high tunnel. It was phenomenal. In fact, one of the produce guys said, that's better than Florida gets. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Dorothy, a great resource here. I appreciate you talking to us every year. Um, Dorothy's, you know, been through the seasons with high tunnels, so if you're looking for an experienced grower, uh, you know, take advantage of our lunch and, and talk to Bill and Dorothy. They have a wealth of on hand knowledge, uh, growing knowledge, and you'd be impressed. I am every year going out to their farm and seeing all that they have planted and that they can manage. Um, so next I'm going to ask uh, Tabitha Eakers to come up. Uh, her and Jason have a high tunnel. They've had it for now, what, four or five years? And Tabitha does some really great things. Uh, she uh, built a greenhouse as well to start plants. The Conservation District actually has cost assistance for greenhouses for folks that want to start plants and that sort of things. So we'll have uh, Caitlin talk here uh, at lunch about the program they have to offer. But uh, <laughs> Tab and Jason are doing a great job. They, they grow a lot of crops, not only in high tunnels, but also in fields. So Tab, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? Okay, so bear with me because I don't like to talk in front of people. I got put on the spot today. Um, That's good. So, so, uh, right. 
just recently, um, I was granted the honor of receiving the nomination for Farmer of the Year for Wayne County. All right. Thank you. Um, so, I have a 16 by 24 greenhouse and a 30 by 96 high tunnel. Um, in the greenhouse, I start really early because I grow a lot of flowers for containers for Mother's Day. Um, some of those flowers, they have to be started early for them to be full and in bloom by Mother's Day. Um, mostly, I grow vegetables uh, for my high tunnel. I don't purchase any vegetable plants. I grow everything on my own. Um, in my high tunnel, I have mainly tomatoes. Right now, I have 210 tomato plants in my high tunnel. I have two rows of half runner beans, a row of cucumbers. I forgot what I grew, Dorothy. And then I have uh, bell peppers. Uh, the way I grow my half runner beans, I put them on a cattle panel, and then from there up, once the, the, they bind to the top of that panel, instead of letting them grow over the panel, I buy like a nylon um, trellising. I hang that from the ceiling of my high tunnel and connect it to the top of that panel. So whenever the beans are full, they grow up. They don't grow into the other vegetables. I do the cucumbers the exact same way. Um, right now, I actually checked yesterday, I already have beans that are about this long. So growing in the high tunnel allows me to grow about a month earlier than planting outside. So it's very rewarding to have vegetables before anyone else uh, because we do sell at a local farmer's market, which is in Cerrito. Um, more crops that we have, uh, what we're actually known for is our sweet corn. Uh, we grew, I'm pretty sure it was 12 acres of sweet corn last year. Uh, we also grow a lot of pumpkins. We provide most of the pumpkins for uh, the pumpkin house in the fall in Canova. So that's one reason that I grow flowers to resell because it kind of offsets the cost of the other seeds that you know we are known for. The pumpkin seed and the corn seed is not cheap nor fertilizer. So um, let's see. I don't really have a whole lot. How are you trellising your tomato plants? Are you using the cattle panels too? Or? No, my tomatoes, I actually stake them. They are staked and tied. I prune them daily. Uh, but right now I have tomatoes that are about half the size. Oh, they're about the size of my the palm of my hand. So I should have tomatoes for too long. And um, I was just thinking there with uh, the caution the sauce. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. At least I'll talk the better part. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I appreciate it so much. One thing, one thing I want to add that I think is important uh, uh, I'm one of the other conservation supervisors here in Wayne County. I'm Jason, and uh, everybody gives me a hard time, but I'm more the mouthpiece, okay? Uh, when it comes to the high tunnel, uh, we go in and we lay all the, the geotech fabric down for her. We plow it, and my nephew Tanner and I help her get started. When I say get started, we got a post driver. She was talking about we've got 200 and some tomato plants that all staked. But we've, we've learned over the years to cheat some. And we've got a, a driver because I'm also the agriculture mentor with Wayne County Schools. And uh, I, I do a YouTube channel, Rocky Knob Farm. And I, I didn't do it for adults, but it's kind of turned into adults. I did it for when the pandemic was going on. I was trying to get agriculture into the school system. And there's some education now that Tab, she's freed up a little bit and does some education. You're going to get a lot smarter from listening to her. So she does a lot, uh, you know, without her and without Tanner, we could do what we do. But I, I do want to tell you, if you've not owned a high tunnel and you're here and you're interested in one, we were there about six years ago. And we were sitting in this crowd working, both of us working day jobs, uh, 
40 hours a week. And the Lord's really blessed us because now we, she actually just quit her job at uh, FedEx a few months ago, and this is our full-time thing. Uh, I do work for the school system. I am a, a conservation supervisor. But farming is became, it's not an occupation, it's a lifestyle. And anybody that owns a high tunnel knows that the more time that you put into it, the better it's going to be. And she puts a lot of time in it. And that's why the, the high tunnel looks the way it does. It's not because of what we do. But we grow a lot of things on the outside. Um, we're, we just took on another seven acres. And Cliff, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, they farm too. They've got a high tunnel and they've got a greenhouse. But the big thing with that, that greenhouse, Bill taught me this years ago that Bill and Dorothy have been our mentors. And he said, the only problem with owning a high tunnel is it's hard to get plants early. He said, the whole big thing is, he said, you know, grow earlier, grow later. Where are you going to get, where are you going to get your plants at? I said, yeah, that's true. So we, we ended up building a greenhouse. And my father-in-law built one also. I built several of those at the school systems now, trying to get ag pushed in schools. And, you know, we not only save money, the thing with the flowers, we do the flowers not because I don't like the flowers. I mean, but I like getting a little money back from the gas bill. We don't have free gas. So we made a profit off of it. We sold several hanging baskets. Uh, if you drive through Cerrito, they've got our hanging baskets, and it makes you proud. But it makes you more proud that you made some money back off of your plants. So we've actually got nothing in our plants. And and they're, they're hurt. Well, oh no, these baskets ain't. No, we actually sold out early, so. But but what I'm telling you is that, you know, I'm no educated uh, biologist uh, by no means, but there is hope if you want to, if you want to grow for yourself, it, it, for what money that you invest and what you get in return, I was just telling the people back there, it's a win-win. You know, if you're just growing for your family, that's fine. If you're growing the market, a thing that Bill had also taught me is what what to grow in it. That's something that you want to consider. If you've got a high tunnel and you're going to sell at a farmer's market, uh, my father-in-law, he, he does it, but cabbage is not feasible in a high tunnel. Um, corn is not something that you want to grow in a high tunnel. But when you get into those half-runner beans that sell for $112 a bushel, that's where your money's at. Or tomatoes. And when you grow something in your high tunnel, if you're doing it for your own self, that's a different, you know, like Ronnie, he's doing most of it for himself, I'm sure. And that's something that you want to consider. Don't use that valuable space that can make you money. Use your use wisely what you're going to plant early. Cucumbers bring bring really good money. And we always run out. So that's that's another good plant that we have. But the, One the, thing that I was going to add is whenever you are growing in a high tunnel, um, pay attention to your daylight, the sunrise, and the sunset. Um, because the way that I've set up my high tunnel is everything that grows tall stays on the side where the sun rises. And then that's my cucumbers and beans because I plant them and they grow straight up. I don't want them to shave my smaller plants. So I do the really tall and then indeterminate tomato plants because they get tall uh, from the indeterminate tomatoes, the determinate tomatoes because they're more, you know, short of the bush stuff. So if you are interested in a high tunnel, you have a high tunnel, plan it out. Watch, watch your sunrise, your sunset, that way you know that your vegetables are getting adequate lighting, and that is going to help them grow a lot better. There you go, so, so the other thing I wanted to tell you about the, the 16 by 24. So a few years ago, you know, even as a supervisor, I won't stand here and lie to you, I was all about the greenhouse. We discussed doing it as a trial, and it didn't make it anywhere. So I told him, I said, well, I'm going to build one regardless. We need it. So we did, and we spent about $3,000. And like I said, it was a upfront investment. It's just like anything else farming. And they say, well, you can't afford to farm, but it, it'll pay off for it. So we built this greenhouse, and we tried to do everything right. We tried to 
put geotech down, put good gravel down, we tried to heat it, double plastic, you know, that's, that's the NRCS specs that we wanted to follow. So now that we, we build it, I actually got on the, the, the state, uh, we've got with the state, and now it is a practice that is offered for the conservation agency. So we actually adopted that policy in the Guyan District, so there is help if you're interested in a small greenhouse. And it doesn't have to be a 16 by 24, but that's like the limit on the on the big side. Of it. Any any questions for me? I can't hear. Is there a noticeable difference in the flavor of the beans grown inside or outside? The flavor of the beans grown inside or outside? I'm not sure if there's that much of a flavor difference, but. Um, as far as looks, there's a big difference. Right. They do grow better. No and bug bugs. they'll have less, uh, like, they have rust, dark, they have bug right, bugs. the rust, the bugs, because you can control that. You can control pests and diseases in a high tunnel, you know, better than you can control it on the outside. And, and again, I'm not a WVU graduate. <laughs> I, I'm telling you what works for us, okay? So, and I'm going to say this, and this is how we do it, and we don't care to share anything we do. So you got a cattle panel here that we start the beans on. Instead of just planting it on one side, we plant beans on both sides. Well, what that does, it's like a double row. It makes a double production. When you get up here high, if you go with a single strain, in our experience, you don't have the thickness that you would want. When you double them up like that, it seems like to us, they're going through cheap picks off the ladder. So the beans look so much better. I can just about look at a green bean now and tell that it was grown in a high tunnel or outside. And if, you, if you want to see pictures, I mean, we don't have anything. I wasn't really prepared to speak, but uh, he has pictures on his phone. I have some pictures. So. There's one thing that I'm, I'm alike with Bill Stewart. I'm always prepared to speak and you all be glad when I sit down. <laughs> And he's very, he's very good at it. Much better than I. Do what, honey? You know, you know, we've had this discussion this year. We we took different kinds of beans, like Cliff experiments with pole beans and stuff, and we took them to the market. And you know, people walk by them, and you can't give them away. But I'll be honest. I wish that people were crazy about bush beans, because I would be buying me an oxbow picker. And I would be harvesting with a tractor instead of picking beans. Now, the good thing is she don't like me to pick beans, so I'm doing something right. <laughs> hey, Jason, I'm very, tell them some of our marketing things. When it, when it comes to... Jason, tell them about some of the marketing things that we do to draw uh, attention, maybe, and to have fun, like uh, put up a sign, I'll put up a sign, so, the air pointing towards Jason. So, so we'll go back to the Cerrito market. You know, Bill and I started this market a few years back, not to call anybody out or anything, but they had asked a group of people to come, which are no longer around, and had begged them to start a market. The city of Cerrito really wanted to support farmers, and they, they're all about taking care of their residents. So they wanted local fresh foods for the, a lot of the older people. And Bill and I go down, and we open up the market, and to be honest with you, it's just like anything else. The first year, you know, there was days that I'd give up and go home and have sit there for thirty dollars all day. And we just shake our head. And Bill told me, he said, uh, one thing about a market, said whether you got much or not, you need to be there. My God, Bill, we ain't got a few tomatoes, and, you know. But we we stuck with it, and we we've, we've grown that market. Uh, these people back here, they can tell you they've been down there. It almost looks like the cheese line at your local welfare office. Uh, sometimes when people are lined up at the farmer's market. I mean, people come in there from everywhere. We've even had people from Charleston come down. And we try to have a good time with it. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill told some people down there he did, he did some matchmaking. And so I told him I did marriage counseling. So if one fails, you, you know. But you got to have a good time. And, you know, older people will stop in at that market and... It's almost like a circus, even if they don't need anything, they just want to stop and hear the bull, you know. So it's a happy place to be, and one of the things that I would recommend if you sell at a farmer's market, 
And this sounds so simple, but we've actually had some people come and sell. And when you go to somewhere to sell, if you're at a yard sale or you're selling a new Buick, people don't want to come around when somebody ain't happy. And if you're having the worst day ever, if you can't go to that market and be happy, that's not the job for you. Because Tab can tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm more into the, I love being around people. I love being the sales. I love talking to people. She'd rather be like Dorothy. She'd rather be right there in the high tunnel by herself. But it is a lot of fun. Wait, you guys practice your crop location for in your high tunnel? You talk about growing for your light and stuff. I don't really do crop rotation in the high tunnel. Because we're mainly we're mainly doing tomatoes and beans, so the only thing we would be switching really is the beans and the cucumbers to the other side. But now one thing that I will tell you that's made a difference. If you, if you got one of those soil probes, don't be ashamed to use it because I'm going to tell you, if you grow you a cover crop in there, it makes a big difference. And for years we didn't, and we did it this year, and I can already tell a difference in the soil. The, the, the crop rotation's great, but again, we didn't graduate from WVU, so they might tell you that we're in the wrong, and that's fine. But we are telling you what works for us. What cover crop is well, this year I used red clover, and I'll tell you why. Because I had some left over, and that's why. Because, But now, let, let's get back to that. I used to use, we grow about 15, 12 acres of sweet corn usually. And a few years ago, I started uh, putting cover crop on, and we started out with winter rye. Why? Because it's the cheapest. Well, then, we got a program out there to help you with cover crop. So... Corinne gives me the NRCS figures, and for the amount of cover to do with winter rise, like 50 some pounds versus 13 pounds an acre of red clover, even though the red clover is higher, for the same money you can have a lot better results. And the red clover does make a, a lot better results. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say don't mix nothing in with the red clover. We might mix some in. Can I interject? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So red clover does fix nitrogen in your soil. So if you're wanting to be an organic type producer, and a clover is a good way to get that nitrogen in your soil. Uh, clover will put anywhere from between 50 and 150 pounds of nitrogen back in your soil. So that's a real cheap, easy way to put nitrogen in your soil. And cover cropping, the more plants you use, the better off you'll be. Because you have to think about, it's kind of weird and abstract, but there are microbes in your soil. And different microbes like different plants. So the more variety, if you can put three in there, you're going to have better soil health, which is going to make your plants grow better. So what would be a good like, three to be together there, like red clover? Red clover, probably a cereal, like a, like a grass cereal, like a rye. You could do uh, like a brassica, like a turnip or a kale. I mean, you know, think about your cover crops also as some place you can steal out of for, you know, in the winter time. Maybe if you want a quick salad or you want some radishes or different things like that. So, I mean, peas, anything like that. Um, just mixing up, even if it's in the same family, they all have different receptors for your soil microbes and it just helps for a healthier soil. And health, soil health is important because if you don't take care of your soil, those microbes are going to die. And then when you throw fertilizer on them, it, they're not going to uh, react as well. So keeping living roots and cover, 100% cover uh, year round, really helps your soil out for the long run. A lot of growers I've noticed kind of let their, their tunnels go barren and then the soil cracks and dries and that's really hard on your soil to come back to life in the spring. So I know that cover cropping can be weedy, but if you can rotate them in, you know, a third or a fourth of your tunnel every year and try to, or maybe if you aren't growing anything and you're like, oh, the tomatoes are done, put a cover crop in there just for the time being to keep those living roots going. I don't have a high tunnel, but I'm a vetch. Vetch is a good one, yep. Vetch is a good cover crop. Does that put a lot of nitrogen? It will put nitrogen in the soil as well. Any of your uh, legume, which uh, clover is a legume species, Vetches, uh, the peas, I believe, will put some nitrogen back in there. Uh, your partridge peas and things like that. Just the variety. Think about how you like to eat, you know, and or your family likes to eat. You know, I was always the one to be like, oh, I like peanut butter, and you know, my 
brother would be like hot dogs. You know, so think about how people are and how, uh, or animals even are. I, I like to mix my three would be uh, winter wheat, winter rye, and we do a little bit of, uh, uh, what did I just say? Clover. Clover. No, no clover. Uh, Buckwheat. What else? Turnip. And turnips. Turnips. Turnips goes a long ways because, like you were talking about eating, we had turnips last year that was, you know, huge. We're not, we're not growing them to sell. We give them to people and eat them ourselves, but... Yeah, and even if you leave them in the soil, that creates those pores and openings in your soil that helps, like, with your drainage and, and the soil tilt, too. So even if you just turn it under, that can help... Uh, you know, Actually, the only the downfall to it, if you're growing sweet corn like we do, Tanner threatened me because he about broke his ankle on seven on those turnips the following year. That's all that matters. Yeah, daikon radishes are good as well. Yep. Does anybody? We do rotate field crops uh, because of the corn, pumpkin, watermelon. We do rotate those. Bill, did you have something? Yeah, you know, you mentioned uh, crop rotation. When we're growing in a high tunnel, we grow in a high tunnel, all of our fertilization goes through drip lines. Our drip lines that puts the water out to the plants, ours has eight inch admittance. Every eight inches, it's putting out water and fertilization to the plant. Each year, if we're growing beans, we can take it and move it to the left, foot and a half. We're in new territory. And we'll do that. We'll then move it back over here. So we're not growing beans within that same row in that same high tide line. <clears throat> and that works real well for us. And, and uh, it, uh, uh, after a period of maybe five years, six years or something, you have to be careful on the fertilization. That's when you need the flooding of the water to take the salts out. And, and uh, <clears throat> because your production will go down a little bit each year that you're doing that. But, but keeping it rotated, and then we plant the cover crops in there. We'll plant turnips and all of that stuff. And, and, and mustard and all the things and turn that under. And that makes a real big difference in, in uh, you know, not growing the same thing in the same area because you're not like a broadcast situation or in a field or something. Uh, we uh, are, are rotating our crops by moving it over and then back and, and, uh, and the space that we have. Well, we just had a question here about salts and cover crops. So salts, let's just, you know, salts are the fertilizers, the over-fertilization that you're putting on. So to get rid of salt using cover crops, you would remove the cover crop from the tunnel. Instead of turning it under to build your organic matter, you would take it out of there. So you would like mow it, rake it out. So that would remove the fertilizers or the salt in either one. And that's, you know, a good way if you're starting to see those numbers. I mean, beans are the most sensitive to salt, and beans are one of the most popular crops grown in high tunnels. So, it's really good after about three years, if you have a high tunnel, you need to start testing it for that EC, which is the salt, cost three bucks. I'll give you three dollars if you do it. Like, just do it. Like, I don't care. I give them people three dollars all the time. I mean, I think it's important and for what you get out of it. It's a lot of knowledge. Well, that's one of the reasons we grow turnips, and we'll uh, give them away to people, or I take mine, and I have game plots. I lease out a lot of my land to a group of hunters. I've had them for 21 years. And I'll take in the, the turnips and things and throw them out or pile them out in an area back in the woods where it's a game plot. And I'll do a lot of the other plants that way. Anything that we have left over or, or uh, for example, we grow watermelons and cook outside, cantaloupes outside. And those we'll take and I'll just take them back there that hadn't been sold, and I'll bust them at one of the game plots. So there's a, a lot of things available to you to uh, uh, let nature work for you instead of against you. And a high tunnel is the greatest thing that, uh, that I've uh, experienced. And the, the automation that he mentioned is, is really important. Because one thing about it, if you've got a high tunnel, you won't sleep in. 
<laughs> but you've got to get out and either you've got an uh, electronic control where it'll open those curtains and close them down and do that type thing. That's what I'm going to, but I haven't been. That's to get up in the morning and roll the sides up on that thing. And if it comes like this, oh God, got to go up the high side and roll the sides down. I always beat that up to do that. Yeah, yeah there you yeah, do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And the other thing about the cleanliness of the thing and disease control. For example, Tabs, not Jason, he's got uh, Tabs High Tunnels, have Tabs Greenhouse, are beautiful inside. Uh, they lay the ground cover down and plant through that and Tabs springs the, uh, the fertilizer the, or the emitters for the water and things right where she's going to put the plants through this fabric. And uh, then as the plants grow and things, as you go in there, you won't find one leaf that fell off anything in there because she sweeps and takes care of it. Same way as her high tunnel. It's beautiful and uh, uh, it's something to be uh, uh, proud of. And when you see it, you're proud of the people that do it. And I believe that, you know, there's a lot of things that might happen to me or something in life, losing the children and so forth. That in a high tunnel, you're working with the plants, you're working, uh, it's, it's therapy. And you'll be surprised how much therapy you get from working <laughs> in one. I have rheumatoid arthritis. And that sun comes through the side of that in the early spring, it's a big help to you. And it's uh, uh, just a, uh, a beautiful thing on this world that you can do to be a part of the growth of the plants and things and bees. Don't you find that? Absolutely. I mean, Jason talks so much, I don't get to, so I gotta talk to my Yeah, friends. you notice who I asked to talk first, right? Okay, I'm thank just, you guys. I got, I got one more thing okay. I wanna uh -oh. say. Uh -oh. So, this is, this is the serious, okay? So if any of you all were involved with 4-H or FFA in your county or in your area, and this is statewide, even if you're not in our district, you're here, Please help me promote something. So we're trying to get more kids involved with growing, not only in Wayne County, but I've been working with Ken Lenhart, uh, trying to get these kids interested in growing. So we come up with a plan, working with one of our delegates, which is Rick Griffith in Canova that does the pumpkin house. Everybody pretty well knows about the pumpkin house, I hope. If you don't, uh, this guy's kind of crazy. He carves 3,000 pumpkins, puts on his lawn every year, and I get some of the pumpkins. So I want to take care of Rick because he takes care of us. So I'd like to let you know about a competition that we got going and there will be cash prizes. We're trying to get these kids interested in growing a large pumpkin. Well, West Virginia now has a large grower pumpkin association, and they've teamed up with us and the pumpkin house, and they're going to furnish good genetically seeds, you know, from bigger pumpkins, and they're going to give those to kids if they're interested. The problem is... We don't have a lot of time to promote it. May 31st is the deadline. So if you could talk to your extension agent, talk to any FFA leader that you have and encourage them to get these kids either as a group and be their sponsor. And if they want to enter to the Pumpkin House contest, it's thepumpkinhouse.com. Go ahead. Okay, so is that where you get the seeds? Because I shared that information to, um, to our district. Uh, and I have six schools that are going to be growing. Okay. So, so Rick had problems with his IT guy. He doesn't do that full time or something. If you go to thepumpkinhouse.com, there'll be an icon in the top right hand corner that says that, that you can register, you get the seed, and you get you a mentor all right there. So at the end of the month, Rick's going to take all those applications and start contacting these people and get with the uh, Grower Pumpkin Association and try to get those kids somebody. They're not only going to have a mentor, but they're going to get good seed. That's good. That's good. But like I said, I appreciate y'all's time and appreciate y'all listening to my wife. Uh, I listen to her a lot and I never get tired of it. All right. I got one more grower. I, I asked it to speak and I think that he brings a, a, a different perspective. Uh, he has two tunnels. It's Ray Ferguson. Um, he has one tunnel and he... he that he grows strawberries in, and then he has another tunnel that he grows more market vegetables, and he does a great job at extending the growing season, having 
uh, more produce longer in the year. So Ray, I'll let you talk. Thank you. I'm Ray Ferguson. I've been growing in high tunnels. I think I was the second one in Lincoln County yes, to uh, get a high tunnel. And the first one, uh, I still have it. It's been growing strawberries all these years. Same crop. Okay. Uh, in my strawberry house, I will put, in my walkways, I'll put down a material, you know, to, so I'm not in contact with the ground. But the strawberries, they're even killing me this year. I think I've been picking between 30 and 50 quarts every other day. And I've probably still got another two or three weeks of that stuff coming. But like I can say it's been a great way for me to be able to get my crops because of the animals. Between the deer and everything else, I mean, I was planting but wasn't getting nothing because I couldn't keep them out. It didn't matter how high the fence was whether the electric was on or off, they were going to get it. <laughs> so, whenever I started planting in the high tunnels, I was actually able to start seeing something from my work. Okay? And like I say, them berries have been growing in there all these years. I have no intentions of putting something else in there. Okay? A strawberry doesn't require a whole lot as far as uh, a fertilization and stuff like that goes. You know, the only thing it requires is the water and stuff like that. When I grow my strawberries, the first berry that comes red, I shut the water plumb off on it. Okay? They get the water that's in there, in the bed, for that whole time until them berries are done. I shut the water off because if that berry is in dampness, it rots. Okay? And if it's not on the ground and it ain't getting damp, then I'm, chances are I'm going to get that berry instead of having to toss it. The other high tunnel I have is in Cabell County. I grow strictly vegetables in it. In that high tunnel, I put nothing down on the, on the ground to, to, in the walkways or anywhere in that high tunnel. Okay? I do make mounds, almost like a potato hill. And I'll plant my crops, my tomatoes, my peppers, my broccoli, my cabbage, all that stuff in them mounds. Well, when I create that mound, I'll create a valley in it, and I'll put my drip tape down to it. Okay, when I first plant my vegetables in there, I'll go through with a water hose, and I'll wet them down good to seal the ground on the top. Okay, but... I'll never hit that, that, that bunch of plants again with a water hose. The drip tape will be where they get their water, okay? And by doing that, I'm keeping everything fairly dry in there. So I don't have to fight the grasses and the weeds and stuff like that that normally grows up that you put, co that you put ground cover on to keep from fighting the weeds. But because I'm controlling the water, I've got six inches of space right there on top of that hill where I have to pull a few pieces of grass or weeds out, you know what I'm saying? But the rest is all dirt, okay? Weeds, grasses, if they don't get water, they don't grow. It's that simple. So that drip line gives the water to them plants, the rest of it ain't getting nothing, okay? In the wintertime, after all everything from the summer and the spring is done, okay, there's a lot of times I would yes in the field. I may I put cover crop out every year whenever we were when we do things out in the field. In that high tunnel, I don't do that. I'll plant broccoli, cabbage, cold crops. I'll plant kale, lettuces, stuff like that. And you know, through the course of the winter, I'll eat that and sell some of it. But then, so my 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 high tunnel that's growing the vegetables. It really doesn't get a really, really get a good rest, you see what I'm saying? But the thing about that one, I always look at it like this. Okay, everything in that high tunnel depends on me. If it needs fertilization, it's my job to make sure it's fertilized. You know, if it needs water, I gotta water it. The only thing, the only thing that I'm not doing is providing the sunlight. And the man upstairs takes care of most of everything in there. So, you know, I mean, 
that's the thing about these high tunnels. We try different things because different things work for different people. You know, and I don't have a lot of time to be in that one pulling grasses and weeds and stuff like that out. But like I say, when I figured out that if I controlled the water, give my plants the water that they need, but not so much that it's going over the sides and into the walkways and, and stuff like that, but you can stick your fingers down in the soil on top of that mound and you can feel that uh, the, 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 the soil is damp. But when I, like I say, when I spray them, when I first plant them, it creates a seal all the way around the top. And it, it just holds the weeds and everything back. It makes it easier for me. I grow some beautiful fruits and vegetables and stuff like that in these tunnels. And there's no way I could do it outside with the way the animals are and stuff. But uh, to me, it's been a plus. And especially with CR NRCS, you know, some of the programs they've gotten, some of them high tunnels, it was actually really cheap for me to get into doing them. You know, if I had my way, I would grow nothing but one crop <laughs> in each tunnel, and I probably would put a cover crop in in the winter. But because I'm trying to take as much advantage as I can of that, what's in that high tunnel, I like planting like winter crops in there too. Because, you know, people eat, even if it's winter time. Anybody have any questions? What's the number one uh, strawberry that you found on the inside in a high tunnel grow production -wise? Production-wise, I had some of, uh, a couple years ago that were cabbage, beautiful berries, nice and firm and stuff like this. And they didn't make a whole lot of runners, but they made great, great berries. This year I have one in there that's called Dickens. Okay, that plant, man, it makes runners like crazy. Okay, and whenever it starts flowering, I can go to one plant and pick almost a half a quart of berries out off of one plant. Okay, there's years whenever I've picked a thousand quarts of berries out of there, you know, and I'm selling for six dollars a quart, so I'm not complaining. You know. The only thing that's complaining is my back. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but, so, so a guy told me that when they used to grow strawberries when he was a kid, and I've never grew them, but I'm just, that's an interest I have. They would always put them in the ground and they would put them in the ground and they would pull all the blooms off. Now hardest to bear. I've never done that. Okay. I'm just curious. But Every three years I have a rotation. Every three years I'll kill them all out because there's so many in there that they just can't make it no more. Okay. okay? And I'll, I'll kill them all off, get them all out of there, and I'll plant new plants in there. Okay? So I mean, what do you do for winter in, in where the strawberries are? How do, you, how do you put them down for winter just like you're outside with straw? Or? Nope. Inside that high tunnel, I don't do nothing. Okay. I wait until January. Sometime in January when, when the sun's nice and my battery really needs charged by then anyway. And I'll get out there when the sun's nice and warm on me. And I'll pull my coat off and have nothing but my t-shirt on. And I'll take a weed eater and go through there and I'll weed eat all of them off to the top of the ground. Okay. Then I'll take a blower and I'll blow them all out. I'm getting as much as I can out of there. I mean, you can't get it all, but you get the biggest part of it. Okay? So I'm cleaning everything out of there so that the only thing that's in there is the crowns and what will come from them crowns. Most of the time, the runners and stuff like that, from like this year, they'll be rooted into the ground where they found places in the dirt where they can root. And it won't hurt them because they're dormant that time of the year anyway. You see? So, anything else? You don't repine with any of the binders from the existing plants? You could, but the thing about it is, is whenever I change over like that, you know, they got so many different varieties, and sometimes you just never know, you know. I've planted some where the flesh on it, you couldn't hardly pull the berry off of it because they were too soft. I've planted some that were nice and hard. You can pull the berry off, but, you know, you better cut it to eat it, you know what I'm saying. And the thing about it is, is you want something in the middle there, you know what I, I mean? I mean, if you've got a good plant that you know does well, with you not use your own runner. You could, you could, but man, that's a lot of work. What, what would be the, the biggest uh, downfall to growing strawberries? Like pest, or would it be uh, disease, or what, what have you run into there? 
Well, as far as uh, the berries, uh, you know, I mean, I guess aphids and stuff like that get in there. But, you know, they can be controlled. You know, I mean, in the greenhouse over there, believe it or not, I can walk down through here and the spiders, they just move out of the way. There's so many of them little bitty spiders in there that work on them aphids and stuff like that that, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy when you walk in there like that. It's, and if you got a fear of spiders, <laughs> it really would work on you, you know what I'm saying? But me, I go down through there picking strawberries and stuff, and they'll just move out of the way as I'm coming. You know, every, I'll come out sometimes with cobwebs on my arm, and sometimes the berries might have a web or two on them. But I think that is actually my biggest predator in there as far as controlling everything, you know, in that tunnel right there. Yeah, Carlos is agreeing with you <laughs> But they really make a big difference in there. And, you know, late in the year I'll see where sometimes they'll put their little spider, spider bulb nest or eggshell. There'll be several of them all around the sides of the tunnel on the inside every year. And I, you, I can tell when they hatch out now. And you don't never have a, a problem selling them. Huh? You don't never have a problem selling That's the easiest selling thing there is. Other than corn and beans, tomatoes, cucumbers, you know. But, I mean, y'all are right about the, about the cucumbers and the tomatoes and stuff like that. That's some of the finest stuff. Green beans, you can't beat them coming out of a greenhouse. Because, like you said, no rust, less bug bites. Stuff like that. It's all controlled. You know, it makes a big difference in the look of that product. It really does. It makes it sell. And it's like you said about the flea markets. I mean, uh, the farmers market. I see people every week, twice a week. They come down and want to buy off of us because they know that they're getting something that's fresh. You know, they can go to the market and they can buy them berries, and they can go to Walmart and buy them. Two fifty. Three bucks a quart. Yep. What are they getting? They can't tell they made a strawberry. <coughs> when they bite into that one of them ones that come from the farm, they know what they've got. And, you know, as, as high as prices are on everything, people still want value for their money, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes that's just the way it's got to be, you know, for, for you to get something you really want. I mean, some and sometimes... In the, in the stores, you'll see beautiful looking fruit. And like heirloom tomatoes. To me, they're not the prettiest in the world. You got all this other fruit that's more, more you know, the same size and shaped real pretty and looks real good. But the heirloom tomatoes, you got the taste and everything that you don't have with the other ones. You know? And people are starting to realize that and they don't care to get a little bit more money for something that's good. And I can understand that. I feel the same way. How's that sure crop strawberry compared to the other The sure crop strawberries. I kind of found that to be a little bit of a one of them softer berries. You know, a softer berry is a great thing if you're making jams and jellies and stuff like this. But it's not one you want to cut and eat whenever you're eating your oatmeal in the morning or or put in a strawberry pie or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Them tougher berries are the ones that you want to eat and put in that strawberry pie because them other ones, they can't handle the heat and stuff yeah, like that. They, they, they squish <laughs> really easy. And what some berries don't. I've always grown the sure quality. So what would you recommend for a good berry? I make pies, jams, and... For jams and jellies and stuff like that? The Dickens berry is a great berry. Like I say, it's not it's not as it's not as hard as the other ones. You can still get it off the strawberry plant without squishing it bad, but it squishes up real easy. Makes great jams and jellies. Okay. Now the Cabot, like I say, it's a harder berry, and it's great for pies and and slicing and eating. You know, uh, fresh berries. This is my uh, show and tell <laughs> presentation. I know you can't see this, but this is a sign that you get for being a conservation, or excuse me, a, a century farm. Or uh, This was mine. This was a sesquicentennial farm. Uh, we also have 200 years, and whatever 250 is, I can't say that word, but 
we have signs for that. This is not a, a big, you don't win a lot, but if, if a farm's been in your family and it can produce, and it can be a, a, like this, it doesn't have to be a cattle farm, it doesn't have to be a thousand acres. If it's been in your family and a little bit of it still exists, just a few acres, then you qualify perhaps for a century farm at least if it's been in the family for a hundred years. So, if, if uh, anyway, uh, I did this. I knew, I knew my farm was in our family for a long time, and I just didn't know how long. So I did a century farm about three years ago, and then about a year later, I found uh, the original deed uh, going through some of my mom's stuff, and so we were back to 1851. So it doesn't cost you anything except a little work. We'll be glad to help you. This year in West Virginia, we have seven of these. Uh, they tell the story that a couple years ago, a lady brought in, her, her deed was on a sheepskin. And it was over 250 years. I think this was down uh, around Lewisburg. So all you have to do is do a little legwork. You can go to the courthouse, dig up some old files, it, 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 it's a good thing, and I know you know people that have had a farm for that. And like this place, they may not have cows and, and hay barns and stuff like that, but, you know, the produce that you grow, it doesn't take much to, to make a thousand dollars worth a year. And it doesn't mean you have to sell it. You just have to have it on your place. So if you know someone, please contact any of us, Guy in Conservation District, I'm the guy that just does it for the state because I kind of enjoy it, uh, and I'll be glad to get with you. I've gone to the courthouse with some people, but think about it. If you know someone who's actively gardening or if they have a cow-calf you know, operation, please let us know. We'll try to get this word out. It's no big monetary thing. You get a pretty cool sign. I have people ask me about this sign. It's right outside my house on, the, on a post. And they're more curious about that than they are about anything else. So uh, if you know someone, please let us know. Thank you. In the same family. For, but it can be a cousin or some other. Well, in West Virginia, that's about everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Stewart's just reminded me if you have valuable timber, and it and doesn't take much to make a thousand dollars. So if you have someone who is into that, that, that they harvest timber, they grow timber, that would qualify too. Because we don't all do the same things they were farming 150 years ago. So uh, you know, if it, I'm sure the operations change. So let me know if you would, and I'll be glad to. I'll hang around here for a while. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. All right, so we're on to our last speaker, and just to let you know, we uh, put everybody's name back in the hat for the two hanging baskets and the $400 box of goodies. Uh, my next presenter works for NRCS. He actually worked for me back in the day and made his way out of the office probably as fast as he could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, and Dustin was very integral and in started in the first farm field day we had in Lincoln County. I don't know if many of you all remember Zeke Wood and Nona and um, all those folks, but uh, they came to us and said they wanted a farm field day, and I said, hey, Dustin, because I like to delegate, hey, this looks like a great project for a, you know, a younger employee. So anyway, Dustin was integral in getting that started, and we think it was 2004. Yeah, I think it was, now Dustin has uh, since then been a district conservationist, the same position I have, and he has taken a detail for the next year to be an urban agriculture conservationist. Is that correct? I don't know. So NRCS has some great new programs, and Dustin's going to tell you about them. All right. So a couple of things. I don't like these things, so I'll probably use it as a pointer as much as anything. And, and it's good that you're here because I figure on a day like this you'd just be sitting at home in a chair, drifting off, and your mind starts to wander and you're like, I wonder what NRCS is doing. 
Because that's normal, right? So uh, what I'm going to go through is is kind of what we've been up to since November, right? So we started this journey into, and I know everybody kind of hates the word, urban agriculture because it's not urban. It's not urban, right? But we've kind of put a West Virginia spin on it. So anyway, we'll jump into it. Where does it need to be? Close to your face. Yeah. I'll just do this. Yes. That's good. <laughs> All right. <sighs> All right. So we started with the chief's decision memo in July of 2022. The chief of the NRCS decided that you know, we've done what we can do for everybody except small scale farmers, right? So if you guys have looked at practices in the past, some that's come up, you want to do a pollinator plot, right? Well, we paid for pollinator plots on the acre. We didn't pay on the square foot or the thousand square foot. If you wanted to put a pollinator plot down here, you know, it might be 500 square feet, something like that, right? Problematic when you're paying for it on the acre. So. The, the cost that we were paying to put in a pollinator plot was it's really fair on the acre. But once you got down to a tenth of an acre, which is the smallest we could do, which was 4,300 square feet, it really wasn't all, all that fair. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through what we've done for some of that. <laughs> I can sit there and do the slides for you. That's probably going to be the way to go. Next slide. Oh, we're good. I got it. I got it. All right. So what we did is we went through a process of reforming the way we approached urban agriculture in West Virginia. And we moved into and we settled on this focus on small-scale agriculture. So within small-scale agriculture, we had this working group. The working group came up with the focus areas. The focus areas are what you might expect. All right. So it's truck cropping. It's like super small scale livestock, you know, five, ten acres, a few animals, you know, a few head of cattle, half a dozen head of sheep, a dozen head of sheep, some goats, something like that. And then we just went ahead and went all in. So we went with wildlife habitat and we went with small scale forestry stuff too. In for a penny, in for a pound. All right, so after we decide we're going to go this route, We've got these small scale practices kind of in the hopper coming down the pike. We had to plug a few holes first. So we adopted some interim conservation practice standards, which are to say they're not super well defined. We're going out there, we're, we're kind of taking the gloves off with it. We're trying some different things. We're going to see what works. What we did adopt was low tunnel, raised bed, and amending soil properties with lock. Go to the next one. And then we adopted, after we plugged those holes, 120 small-scale scenarios across 33 common practices. So, when we start looking at the individual practices, the low tunnel comes up first because that's my favorite, and I hope it becomes quickly all of your favorite. Um, we've got some here in the back you can look at if it stops raining or on your way back to your car. But what a low tunnel is, is just it's not a high tunnel right so it's the same kind of idea you can approach it from a dozen different directions and like I said it's an interim conservation practice standard so the gloves are off on how we construct it right we can do it with bent metal bows we can do it with black plastic pipe the the thing that we've found we really like is the uh, is it half inch or quarter inch uh, I think it's half inch, half inch uh, PVC electrical conduit good stuff. It makes a nice sturdy bow, lasts a long time. And in that same spirit, we have multiple covering options. So if you look back here again, we've got a couple of covering options back here. You can do everything from the, you know, the white woven fabrics for, you know, season extension to get you past the freeze period. You can do shade cloth, you can do bug net, or you can do greenhouse plastic. 
So, you know, like I said, these are for, for early season extension and they're for getting you over the hump in the in the summertime with problems you might have. Like I said, again, be it bugs or, you know, put some shade cloth on, keep your lettuce from getting bitter, or yada, yada, yada. But the cool thing about these, and the place where these really beat high tails, one is on cost, obviously. But two, at the end of the season or, you know, if you're done using them in the summer for whatever purposes you had, take it down, fold your cloth up, Straighten your bows back out. You know, it's just PVC. Once you take the tension off of it, it's going to pop out. Slide it in the shed or under the under the deck, whatever whatever you need to do there. But these are a fantastic, cheaper option for all of the sorts of things high tunnels do. Now we can go to the next one. All right. So this is the one that tends to get everybody excited. I'm going to temper your excitement right now. Just <laughs> take a breath. Stop. Stop. All right. So. We're finally doing raised beds through our programs, right? The thing is, is the way conservation practices are approved for use is they, they need to solve a problem, and traditionally raised beds don't solve a problem unless the soil is, we're just going to say, bad, right? So we can adopt raised beds we can do them a multitude of different ways this is the standard drawing we use and it's it's a pretty standard construction setup it's you know four by four corners it's two by six down the sides but the problem comes in with meeting that intended resource concern of creating a growing environment above a bad soil so we can only use these on debris sites or contaminated sites Sites that you otherwise can't grow in the soil part of That hasn't come up yet. I, I don't have an answer to that. The good news is the conservation district can do raised beds on any site. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, we're offering raised beds now under certain circumstances. Let's go ahead and roll on to the next one. Let's not linger on it. All right. So when we get into the small scale scenarios of those 33 typical practices we do, you know, it's kind of been touched on the why, and uh, the rhyme guy kind of stole my thunder on number three, I think it's the high tone. But anyway, so we're talking about, I always like to start off talking about the pollinator plot, because the pollinator plot before was $700 an acre, became problematic when it was $70 for a tenth of an acre, right? Nobody can put in a pollinator plot for a tenth of an acre. By the time you buy your seed, have it shipped, and any consideration for ground work, right? Impossible. So it certainly wasn't fair. What we did was we switched to a scenario where it's paid by the thousand square foot. So now if you want to do 500 square foot, that's half a thousand square foot. You want to do 2,000 square feet, that's 2,000 square feet. And right now, for 2023, our payment rate is $121.05 per thousand square feet. So by way of example, if you plan to plant 1,500 square feet, which you couldn't have done before, right? Because the minimum was a tenth of an acre, that's 43.56. Uh, so if you were going to do 1,500 square feet, That'd be 121 times 1.5. We're paying 181 bucks an acre now to do a very small scale pollinator planting where before probably would have been about 70 bucks. So if we look at without the small scale payment rate, you know, in this particular case, I just took that minimum, that tenth of an acre. This year we paid 648. You can plant more for 648.81 or you can plant way less for 181 bucks. Now it kind of gives you a little bit of leeway to buy your seed, gives you a little bit of leeway to pay for fuel for your tiller, etc., etc., to buy a little uh, herbicide if you need to. Yeah. So now we've moved to a situation where it's fair to do small-scale agriculture, right? Let's go to the next one. Another common one, this one is brand new, so we didn't really have a problem with it before, but this shows kind of the example of how things become more or less fair. If you look at a low tunnel at a thousand square feet, we're paying 
$4.25 a square foot. That's a pretty fair deal. So in my example here, I've got, you've got two rows, 30 foot long. You're going to put in a low tunnel at three foot wide. So that comes out to 180 square foot, $4.25 per square foot times 180 square foot. We're paying $7.65. Now if you go up in scale to over 1,000 square feet, that payment rate drops quite a lot, right? But that's, you know, this is where the economies of scale come in. So if you're doing, you know, thousands of square feet of load tunnel, we pay less, but you're also buying it by the roll, you know, which is going to save you big bucks versus buying by the foot always. And, you know, you probably are going to be able to get a better deal on your, your bows and your materials like that. So in this particular case, that, that, that same 180 square foot, you know, at that lower rate is 207. So again, we're accounting for all of the little intrinsic things that, that add up over time as you're putting it into practice. All right, so this is the one, again, Rommel kind of stole my thunder. I had a big point I was going to make, but well, it, it's probably going to be a good one. <laughs> All right, so we can do a small scale high tunnel or we can do a large scale high tunnel, right? And I'm here to, you know, we kind of went through this with Rommel, uh, 1152 square foot max at 1057. If we did a 20 by 40, we're gonna pay 84.56. The same payment rate, uh, the same square footage at the lower payment rate, that's a lower number. But the more important point here is we've taken into account that putting in a small scale tunnel, obviously it's going to have some, some additional costs with it. You're going to lose some of those economies of scale when you're buying your plastic, all of that. But we also pay a better payment rate on a super small tunnel because maybe you're putting it in your backyard and your fence is that wide and you can't get a tractor through there, there, that way you can't, you know, have that tractor to help you erect your tunnel and get everything squared away, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to take more people, it's going to maybe take more time, it's probably going to be put up by hand. But the larger point I wanted to make about the super small tunnels, and I think he hit on there a little bit ago as well, is the higher payment rate's kind of an inducement from us to right size your tunnel. You know, if you want to put in a tunnel for personal consumption, a pretty small tunnel will produce a whole lot of food, right? So unless you're going to go into production, maybe you don't need to put in a huge tunnel. You put in a small tunnel, it'll serve you and your family, and you put in that uh, 20 by 40, 800 square foot, it'll realistically probably serve most of your closest neighbors as well for a good part of the season. But as you're looking at practices, it's, it's time for our small scale farmers to stop worrying about, you know, the, the, the payment inequity and really focus on conservation. We have a bunch more practices that I don't really cover here, but I mean, we're talking everything all the way down to uh, cover crop, to crop rotation payments, to uh, reduced tillage payments. Everything's down on the thousand square foot level or the per square foot level. so. We can start building out conservation systems that look like very large form conservation systems on a very small scale. So I will talk about briefly, because all of this is going to change, but how we have piloted the way we are treating urban with environmental quality incentives program. So if you look down here, that's where you guys are. We took a two-pronged approach this year because we were late getting to start. Again, I didn't start until November. But, so we took a two-pronged approach to gather as much data as we could. And we went with, we're calling it community urban ag, which was based in five conservation districts. And that process was conservationist driven. So the district conservationist and the soil con and the technician could make a call on what is urban. And we created our own West Virginia definition of urban. And I'm going to tell you what it is because I think it's hilarious. If you can see two dwellings, if you, it's, it's an apartment <laughs> building with two units in it, and you can see it from your field, it's in. If you can see a divided highway, 
it's it. If you can see a railroad, it's it. If you can see a go mart, it's in. If you can see a dollar store, and really, where can't you see a dollar store these days? It's in. Right? So, we, we made this whole thing conservationist driven just so we can push it out to as much of West Virginia as we possibly could. We had a really good response with no public notification, no real conversation about it, except for between the folks that walked in the office and Corinne. But we're going to fix that this year, and this was my first stop on this little tour, and I will be all over the state talking about this. But this is the way we're going to do it from now on in West Virginia when it comes to urban. For 2024, you know, we're going to blow this up, and this whole the whole state's going to be blue. Let's go to the next one. We, I think we had eight or nine that were funded under this fund pool last year. So our 2022 numbers, which used uh, a geospatially driven census layer based process, we approved four contracts for like $46,000 in the entire state. This year, between these two approaches, we've done almost $800,000 worth of pre-approvals. And we had, we had 90 some, we had 90 some applications across the state. But, so, the other half of what we did was we stuck with the geospatial approach, we expanded it. So you'll see all these little pink dots around here. That's a combination of a census layer saying where is, there is an urban population as defined by the Census Bureau. The unincorporated places layer, which as we all know in West Virginia is where everybody lives. You know, nobody lives in downtown Bridgeport, everybody lives like on the edge of Bridgeport. Um, so, you know, we, we expanded it out just to see what it would do, and it, it produced, I think, right at 20 applications, which is way more than we did the year before. But what we're going to do moving forward is where that whole state is going to be in with that conservationist-driven approach is if you're, and this is going to kind of make sense to most of you, if you're in Huntington, which I know we're in Hamlet right now, but if you're in Huntington, you know, it's, it's a little tougher. There's a whole lot more people in Huntington. There's a lot less farming base, so we're going to give them a little bump if they're in that defined urban area as we rank applications out. So, you know, you might see somebody who's immediately, maybe even in Cerrito, I'm not sure exactly how that layer works yeah, out, something like that. Yeah, so if somebody's in, in town, they're probably going to get a little bit of a bump, but, you know, we've, that's, that's the conceit we had to make to keep it kind of open and loose to the whole state with a... If you can, if you can see a house, you're good. Kind of approach. I think it's all I've got. Okay. There's the uh, EO civil rights statement. Feel free to, to read that. It's a good read. Yeah. So I think what uh, what Dustin's been working on, which we're glad of, because he he came from this district and he understands what uh, community agriculture is. You know, a lot of times I get in the office like, how can we compete with Greenbrier County? or Mason County. So this kind of levels the, the playing field to get more applications and more approvals in these smaller ag areas. So that's what this is kind of geared towards and also towns um, as well because we do have some community uh, growers and things like that. So thank you all for coming. Uh, if you put your email address down, I'm going to add you to our mailing list or email list. If you don't want to be on the email list, just email me back and say, delete me from your list and we will. And I appreciate you all coming and have a safe trip home. Thank, thank you. you very much.